Yo, how's it going, folks? Welcome to episode 155 of the Simple Life Podcast. Hope you're keeping well. Hope you are enjoying the last ribs of summer. I've been off for three weeks, so I haven't been here to complain about the fact that we haven't fucking had a summer. I know I complain every week, but again, northeast of England, we only get like two days of sunshine. So uh, the fact that we've had about four hours cumulatively this year, it's quite frustrating to me. Um, but yeah, we are due a heat wave apparently in the next couple of weeks. So anybody local, uh, do check out the Durham City Cannabis Club events up and coming over the next two weeks. Uh, this weekend, we will be down at Hemp Gardens doing a clear up uh, community uh, job. So we've got two horticultural companies and a lot of specialists coming down to help us identify the species. We're going to be cutting down uh, all of the brambles and rediscovering all of the original paths so that we have more infrastructure for the event two weeks after the end of summer session, folks, 21st of September. Get your ass down. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. And yeah, uh, free to all adults. Welcome, everybody. So please uh, come on down, meet some people uh, from the community. Uh, yes, the big thing. I'm aware of the elephant in the room. Product Earth just happened last weekend. I'm doing a write-up. There's various things on record at the minute. There's an incredible amount of misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories and, and bullshit going around at the minute. What we know publicly, what is on the record officially, uh, and what we know that actually happened is the venue basically shit the bed. Uh, people were consuming cannabis inside, and as per, I think it's Section 8D, maybe, of the uh, Misuse of Drugs Regulation 1971, uh, the, it being a music venue, their license uh, could have been pulled, uh, its alcohol license as well, so it became quite problematic, I think, and uh, communication seemed to have broken, broken down into the evening on Saturday, and thus the cancellation, I think, was announced at about midnight. Um, I have sought comment from uh, the directors and from the founders and will be reporting back uh, soon. So check out legacyculture.co.uk uh, for that, as well as um, away, what do we call it? Oasis or Mirage, uh, an in-depth analysis of the new Oasis tour and what is happening with the dying uh, UK music scene, which is a perfect segue into today's uh, guest, who is a uh, UK-based uh, musician, wait, Northeast, because that's, that's different to the rest of the UK. We're special up here. I know Manchester says it does it differently, but they don't know the Northeast, so and they don't know the Northeast. Anyway, let's segue into today's guest, who is a Northeast multi-genre rapper, MC, poet, writer, and esports caster. I know, quite a collision of things. Look forward to uh, talking more about those. Um, whose debut out of... Wait, I've scribbled... Oh. Wrong notes. I'm reading from a <laughs> previous notes there. Uh, his debut album, um, uh, he was released a debut album, Dust to Much Acclaim. Uh, they've recently sm uh, mixed up the genres and are now doing a Geordie Japanese dancehall album. I know, crazy. Again, looking forward to digging into that. Um, honestly, I listened to it this morning and it will uh, make you question everything you think you know about multi genre mashups. Uh, today's guest is Geordie Bigfoot. How are you doing, brother? Oi, oi. Yeah, I'm very good, mate. Thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, big up. That's quite a lot of episodes as well. 155. Yeah, on a good streak. Um, yeah, well done just for yourself. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just enjoy these conversations. I enjoy meeting and uh, yeah, sharing publicly these kind of in-depth, raw and honest and authentic conversations with people. Because too often, I think podcasts have become quite... Uh, here's a product and here's a service and it's very fluffy and advertising it's like nah man we're gonna swear we're gonna smoke weed we're gonna hang out and talk about the real shit that matters to real people on this podcast so yeah hopefully many more will uh be coming um yeah man like i said during the intro there it, it's meant how have you ended up with all, all of these things are so different like people would then think of what is a Geordie. Most people are thinking beer belly, bald guy down at the tune, you know, having a few of the brown, brown ales. Like they have this this preconception of what a, a, a Geordie is, especially even like the Geordie musicians and Geordie culture. So how did, how and when did you sort of first get in, in, into music? And yeah, you, tell us your story, please. Yeah, well, I, I think it's really important to remember there's a lot of different types of Geordies. Like, I only got a super strong Geordie accent. My parents aren't, aren't from Newcastle themselves, but I, I'm born and bred, so... I used to get I used to get called posh in primary school um, and high school a little bit and Lanky Street Lanky Street a piss as well. Um, but, um, Not very tall though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. But the the music thing came in. I was I was in primary school. I tried like six or seven different instruments and never stuck with anything past like a month or two. Um, I think that's what they, I think that might have been early signs of what they like to call ADHD coming in. But that's also part of the superpower and part of the the multi genre multi uh, ability thing i've just i've always just thrown myself fully into things that uh pique my curiosity and give me that 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 sort of excitement of um of when you're producing and finishing something mm -hmm. um so it was probably 
I think that yeah, I think that me getting into music uh, and sticking with it was actually the movie Scratch, um, an early documentary about the development of scratching and turntablism. So my first venture into music was be trying to be a turntablist at the age of about fourteen or so. After like two or three years of smashing through like Trojan box sets uh, and a bit of hip hop, like my first two CDs were Dr. Dre, the uh, two thousand and one, and Slim Shady and Marshall Mathers LP. And I used to I used to listen to them at like 11 years old, painting Warhammer and that. <laughs> but then then got into all the reggae and dancehall, which like was partly an influence from my dad and partly like my bigger brother and my next door neighbor. They were had all the Trojan box sets, so we were making our own mini discs like of of reggae and dancehall and stuff. And that's kind of where it all started, and uh, it just bloomed from there into promoting events um, where I would pick up the mic once or twice. Didn't really do much. Um, then I went to Japan to make music videos, and it was while I was in Japan that I started writing the first verses for the songs that became Trinity Lo-Fi, me and Louis Zico's rap group, which was the first venture before I had to go solo. Wow. So I appreciate you pausing there and not just jumping through the next chronology because obviously you've traveled quite a lot and oh, it's been a lot, quite yeah, a lot yeah. of inspiration. So <laughs> a good jumping off point. So it's it, the thing that uh, I, I found it resonating in my brain this morning, listening to to the most recent project that you're working on, the, uh, the, the dancehall album, is kind of early Wu Tang of the mashup of styles. If there wasn't really Eastern influ influence in hip hop, uh, in a mainstream or or to the degree of, of notoriety and popularity until like Wu Tang came together, and mm. it's something that you mentioned obviously Zico and some. I remember in some early days Zico was doing like uh, some eight bit projects and stuff like that, and again just exploring the the new technologies and the new sounds and see playing through the evolution of that. And you said before that uh, obviously you went from sort of scratching. Did you, I mean, do you do your own producing? I know you do your own videography. Um, so are you into the theory of, of music as well? And do you do produce uh, your own stuff as well? So theory is kind of where I struggle, but uh, luckily the new reason, um, a few reason updates ago, they released a thing that called scales and chords where you don't actually need to know theory. I just haven't really sat down with it properly yet to make my own beats. Um, you know, making your, you say I do the videography and that's a big point. It's like, you know, making a music video can be one, 200 hours of work. Right. So wow. if, and then writing, writing and recording a song can be anything from like two hours to, to 10, 20 hours. Like sometimes writing a song takes forever. Recording it takes forever to get it just right. Sometimes it's really fast. Like there's some songs I've written in half an hour and recorded in half an hour and they're bangers, but um, it can take a while. So yeah, with doing the, the music production, the music recording, the video production and the, the music management, I, I just, I don't have time or headspace to make the beats as well. Um, so I generally, I generally float around different producers that I know mostly from the internet or personally and stuff that are happy to work with me without charging me like $400 a beat. Um, like some of these, these parasitical producers are trying to like really monetize this thing that should actually be, that, that comes from the community based thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I work with producers that are into niche multi-genre stuff and are happy to work on a project together and split the 10 pence we get from streaming. Fucking streaming services. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's... I did make I did make sorry I did make one album before before we cut off I did I did produce one album which I produced on a Game Boy, um on LSDJ um and that's that's me and Zico it's called Signs of the End Times, um but that's the that's, that's the only full project thinking, I've yeah. done yeah yeah that's, that's sorry I looked back at things this morning but obviously I know a lot of your stuff from first time when I was in before I was involved in cannabis and drug reform publicly and basically before I got so busy with this that I just abandoned my my fun part of my life of going out and sessioning and doing free parties and festivals and part of the scene and yeah so there was a lot of alcohol and drugs in those days so I, i'm just there's pieces of memories and i was sticking together there was a the thing there's a thing glad glad we got there and we uh, figured it out uh that does actually help me connect some of the history of my life there so that's good that's good um good. <laughs> nice so as you've evolved then th through that like the second project then dust uh tell us about that like so you were doing with zico and that was kind of, what was the genre differences like how was the evolution from the the music you were producing with the first album into the second well just for the record um the trinity lo-fi canon is about six albums or something like it's wow. not one we, we 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 were smashing it and there was there was kind of a, a solo album in the trinity lo-fi discography because uh zico had a kid and was very busy and stuff um and that's that's kind of how Trinity Lo-Fi sort of to drift apart a bit, you know. Having having a child takes up so much brain space and stuff, um, and then having to work and all that. So I I I, but I decided to go more solo with a reggae producer I met in a Californian reggae Facebook group. I was going to be passing through California. 
they didn't actually give me the visa because they said I was like going to try and stay there. I didn't have enough money in the bank. So I never passed through California on my way to Canada. But I posted in the Californian reggae group, is there any Californian reggae producers that want to make some of my weird rap reggae stuff? And a German guy got back in touch called Tandaro um, from a small island called Lindau in Germany. Um, and he said he wanted to make some reggae with me. We, we we drafted a handful of songs. Only like two or three of them got released in the reggae style. And then when he, I, I invited him over to Notting Carnival to hang out before I flew over to Canada. Um, and we he was showing me like a lot of the new wave, like trap and hip hop, Post Malone uh, and stuff like that. And I was, I was really into the, the sort of genre of this, 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 this America, the where American hip hop had gone. I hadn't really kept my finger on the pulse for a little while. Um, and I was like, why don't we do something a little bit like that, but like not completely. Um, and that's where the idea for Dust came about was to make like a, a conscious trap album. And um, there's always, there's been a lot of conscious boom bap and stuff, but there didn't seem to be much that was like touching on that newer wave of newer wave hip hop. So that was the the seed of that, that project. And then like I was, I flew over to Canada and I wrote and recorded it in Canada. Um, I quit my job as a tree surgeon because the bosses were money hungry uh, narcissists and people were getting hurt left, right and center. So I quit that job and um, got a job in a resort, which had a huge tip check. It was the most expensive resort in North America. So at the end of the season, there was like a, at least a $10,000 tip check guaranteed. And I also had six months of savings because it was food and board. And I was like, well, I've got like 15,000 quid. What do I do with it? Mm. Um, I was like, why don't I spend it all on a trip to Japan to make a one hour music video for this album? So I rang up my mate, JJ, who's a photographer and was like, bro, do you want a free trip to Japan for two months? If you just help me with all food, accommodation and flights paid for, if you want to just help me out with the filming. He just was like, fuck yeah. So we did that, that was the seed of it. And I just threw all my money at it and it went over budget as well and uh, came out with this awesome project, Dust, yeah. So this is the vis- yeah the visual album video when you see it the the quality of it is I was gonna say, I'm, for someone who's not involved in the space and actually the only video editing I do is is me chucking about a couple of bits on here so to then see the the quality of it, it it does speak for itself that you went out there and you actually it's not just a you're out for a weekend sort of job you can you can see the craft of it um, and I think it, it is very complimentary of the the music that you've, you produced for it like was it. Did you have the video in mind, any p- aspect of this when you were writing the tracks themselves? Or was it was there like a natural synergy towards when it came to making the video, you just knew kind of how you wanted it to flow? So the album wasn't finished when the idea to film it in Japan as a full movie was coined. So about halfway through the album, or maybe two thirds, that idea was coined. And that that steered the completion of the album quite quite mm-hmm. well, I think. Um, and I, it's um, it's not very obvious, but it's it's, it's designed as a visual yin yang um it opens up at daytime goes to five songs at night um which are like dark city urban songs like trappy rappy grimy and then it switches over to daytime in this after one of the most hard after the hardest trappy song so you go right down at the shadows and there's quite a quite a dark song and dark video then you come back into the light and there's like more spoken wordy poetic stuff um and then it finishes again at nighttime um, with like the p- positivity of darkness, a song about stars and the moon and stuff. And it's so it's, it's a whole visual yin yang. Um, and that was that was sort of what the direction it was steered to for the last the last songs and the ideas for the videos. Um, but the ideas for the videos themselves were mostly my brain. I was actually packing my house up the other day and looking through the notes. And I was I was just I was pissing myself laughing. I was like, how did I do that without notes? Like nearly all of it was just from my brain it's like like i was saying like they, they like to call it adhd disability etc but it's it's just a di- it's just a difference right like I have, I have a superpower for comprehending these projects that really excite me and a complete lack of interest in working a nine or five or all this other bullshit you know so it's, it's actually like it's not it's actually a blessing not a curse you know what i mean 100 100 i think i can uh, share your affinity for that um definitely it's it, yeah, I think my only weakness in that is is finishing all my projects uh, because I get so excited by the next one. But it's... yeah, that's the that is definitely a really hard one. I call it completion paralysis. Um, mm. When you need to have completion, what I don't I actually have a word for the, what you need to have, but what, what I found helped helped me with that was um, the endorphins of completing a project and seeing it finished can is is the cure for completion paralysis in my opinion. Like mm-hmm. so, you sometimes you just got to force yourself, right, or do to do whatever it takes. But once you've got there, the, the for me, the endorphins of like putting out a finished album with a cover, a full track, fully mixed, mastered, everything sounding e- e- like the same levels and stuff. The the happiness of that was enough to inspire me to do the next one, 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 etc. Yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I can relate to that in terms of writing. When I first started writing for for Ice Smoke all those years ago, it was so difficult. Mm. Like I could throw everything at the screen and be like, yeah. But then when it came to finishing it off and actually having to send it over, that critical part of my brain, it, the the negative aspects of, of my personality was so heightened versus the potential positive benefit of it because it hadn't had the experience of positive feedback. And then with each iteration, it's just got easier and easier. So now I can, I still struggle with the content of the thing of being like, well, hey, usually keeping it on point, I'll write an article and end up having to take another article out of it because I ended up like sidebarring so much. Um, but then I'll finish that and then I'm, oh, I'm already halfway through another. So then it, gets, it just can snowball through the project. So I think, yeah, just pushing through it's like uh, an atrophied muscle almost. You've got to uh, strengthen it and train it for it to become, um, you know, workable and functional for you as a person. Uh, I swear we are. Uh, so then, yeah. How then would you say, or what would you say then, was it being in Japan uh, and filming the video there? Did Because I remember you brought over... I don't know if you were involved. I think you were involved. I mean, again, my brain, I'm sorry. A lot of drugs. I used to take a lot of drugs, people. So I'm sorry if this comes out wrong. It was a deep impact. The dub crew from Japan was, and they because where the hell did I see them? Uh, direct impact. So they, they was have been Love around. Festival? Yeah, yeah, they were at One Love Festival. So that's actually, that was, that was, my, that's my reggae connection to Japan. So I did, I did live in Japan in 2011 um, when I was more into music videos. Like I said, and I started writing lyrics then. Um, I didn't really meet too many reggae people there, but it was at One Love Festival in 2015, I think, was me and Zico's first reggae festival. And um, actually, Zico didn't, I don't think Zico made that first one. Um, so I did I did, I did this, this weird solo set um, that wasn't planned. But um, Direct Impact were playing afterwards, and there was an MC called Erika Crimson, who's actually definitely one of um, Japan's best dancehall MCs ever. So she's worth checking out, Erika Crimson. Um, Crimson with a Y, I think. Erika with a K. Um, and then there was Tutor Real, who's a member of um, Direct Impact as well. And uh, they did this awesome set. And I obviously went to chat to them afterwards because after having lived in Japan, I was just fascinated that they'd come all the way over the ring to do this. Um, the next year I met uh, uh, Leo or Javanese. Um, so that was I'd met the full, full Direct Impact crew and uh, just really, really nice people, really, really good hearts, uh, really, really good selectors. Um, 30, it's their 30th anniversary this year. Um, and we've, we've been friends since nearly 10 years ourselves. So they've been going a lot longer than uh, I've even been doing it myself. Yeah. So this, this, this tour that's upcoming, I did write on the application. Are oh, we doing it alongside Direct Impact's 30th anniversary, et cetera? Um, but because it's, because it's a limited budget, like a lot of the tour we're also doing by ourselves. Me and my mm -hmm. partner, um, who's also my DJ at the minute, which is just a perfect setup. <laughs> it's great. Nice, nice. That does help. That does help. It means uh, talking after hours isn't so much of a problem chasing them up on WhatsApp at two in the morning. You just roll over and go, mm -hmm. I've got an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, sweet, sweet. Yeah, that, that, vaguely, vaguely. I'm trying to put it together. I think I went to about four or five One Loves, but One Love was often my end of festival, end of season festival. So yeah, I'd usually yeah. I've done like five weekends of blowing out my dopamine. And by the time I arrive at One Love, it's just like I'm going to smoke in the sun for four days and wander around for rec with reggae. Um, but yeah, I, I remember seeing them. Um, I don't know if they came back again another year or if it was that year, but I do remember seeing it. And, and they being, played most years, yeah. Yeah, being in, inspired it by it. Down. Yeah, it was a shame, like, I'm not going to say anything too libelous, but yeah, it's a shame One Love went the way it went, seemingly, allegedly, because of management. Um, but I'm not going to say anything else on that because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I, I'll say something. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. It's, it's, good, it's, good, it's good for the people that never got paid that it's not happening anymore. <laughs> I would, I would agree. I would agree on that. Hundred percent would agree on that. I mean, there's a lot more allegations of things that I've heard and think, but I just don't want to put yeah. to record. But yeah, it's uh... well, well, I, I can put to record. Some people never got paid, and like that was that yeah. was so that's it's you know festivals need, but that happens with a lot of festivals. Loads of people leave people yeah. hanging dry in that. Yeah, I mean, Boomtown only pays probably 10, 20 percent of their lineup because the majority of the lineups underground artists, and not a single one gets paid. It's all just tickets, and that's that's the way the UK festival economy kind of works, and the way the UK music economy kind of works is like you've got to be happy to be at the table rather than uh, getting any slices of the bread, yeah. So, oh, it's exposure and it's experience and all of the other shit that they give you. Yeah, so I wrote an article recently for Legacy Culture. Uh, I think I initially titled it Death of the Festival after um, uh, the Slamboree tune, um, which I think Natchi now saying is Death at a Festival. Or is it? No, it is Death of the Festival. And my editor changed it, so I can't remember what the actual article is, people, but you can find it on there. And I looked at the analysis of this, and yeah, it's like in the past 12 months, 100 
festivals, sorry, 100 plus festivals this year are billed to not exist moving into next year. There's been like two to 300 over the past sort of decade that have mm. just, just come, gone and fallen apart. And you've got your big boys like your Glastonbury and that. They're eternal. The amount of money and the connection and the guy that owns it and what they're doing, yeah, yeah. that that's bulletproof. But we saw, again, like I said, what happened to Boomtown with the, the reset and how the smaller size of it and the scale of it. And I think because of everyone trying to put on a little local festival and a bunch of people get together, and if you don't have the passion, if you don't have the commitment, if you're not of that culture and you're just there to exploit it, you'll maybe get a couple of years out of it, but it doesn't build into um, into a real... It doesn't have an authentic cult, uh, cultural identity itself. Do you know what I mean? And people will maybe go for a few commercial artists. But as we're seeing now, it's this, the headliners, the breaking of headliners, rather than spending you know 90% of your budget on four headliners and then filling the rest, people are trying to promote more local talent. People are, are trying to um, diversify sort of the genres that you'll see. I mean, like some Boomtown's always done really well at this with its micro venues and its kind of different yeah, it's crazy uh, good. Th- th- themed areas. Um, but I mean, something we were talking about in the preamble was sort of the lack of, um, uh, sort of awareness, the lack of space to promote smaller artists in, in, from local areas around the UK, that there is kind of this flavor of what the UK is and people then go, oh, well, they think of like Ed Sheeran or some shit. Do you know what I mean? They immediately jump to these, these, these big names. I mean, the UK has obviously had a, a massive impact on like global, globally renowned sort of the celebrity musicians and artists. But we've also, the reason we've got there is because of all of this local scene and talent inspiring each other and people going and seeing each other. And as more and more venues close, as festivals become financially prohibitive. Um, what do you think that, that that the future looks like for, you know, artists like yourself that, I, no offense to any music, obviously I really like it, but it's not like top of the pops if that was still going they're gonna promote it's not it even it's not even it's not even top of the underground barely mate it's like reaches reaches really hard but just for, for the record like, i'm happy to be at the table without making money off it like otherwise i wouldn't be doing it and i think that's that's yeah, so that's so that's that's a found that's a that's the foundation is that if you haven't got a foundation of passion you've lost the game so first mm-hmm. of all yes i'm happy to be doing this for 12 years and be 20 grand in debt 25 grand in debt to it um like <laughs> but the future uh does need to be the future like the future of a lot of things is uh Di- like divested like local like um less of a hyper focus on the massive gravy trains and that are all just like very very similar and and uh homogenized boiled down simple lowest common denominator loads of ways of putting it and uh more focus on uh uniqueness um like raw talent raw vibes etc um how do we get there? Like, which is the same as anything. You need a massive cultural shift, and that's not easy. But all, all cultural shifts start with start with personal culture shifts. So, um, I for, for me, my, my my contribution to the change is just to keep on grinding, keep on making unique, positive music with a message, and uh, never giving up. And um, hopefully, like my inspiration for doing this is people that have done this before. So hopefully, I I can inspire one, two, three. If I inspire three people throughout throughout 20 years of making music I, well, I hope it's 70 right but if i inspire three people in 20 years to make of making music to do something similar and put their heart and soul into something and realize that they can graft save up buy a camera go and do something wild in another country or whatever then that's 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 how we get there right it's like because that's one into three three into nine nine into 27 20 etc right yeah yeah man no 100 percent. it's it is it's it's i think it's the answer to most of the things that we face in society these days is we all want the, the 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 problem to just be solved without ever mm. making the changes and, and putting the effort in. I mean, we alluded to the Oasis tour earlier. When I was researching mm. that, I found uh, an article from Barclays basically going, oh, the peripheral economy, uh, thanks to the era's Taylor Swift tour, gained one billion. And then they broke it wow. down by like about 800 pounds on average was spent by your Swifties on hotels, on da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And you look at that and you go, okay, who did that really help? Like, were any of the grassroots music venues? No, because she was only playing huge fuck-off arenas. And then you think of the uh, secondary and third kind of industry that's involved in that, of insurance, of event management, of uh, mm. all of all of that. It's all jobs for the boys, money for the boys. None of these people, like you said, would give 12 years of their life to passionately produce something that makes their heart sing, that makes them feel that they are providing something to the world that no one else can. I think that mm. is an immeasurable um benefit to society you can't put a price on that you, you're giving far more to society than the billionaires produce you know in, in value because their value is from robbing everybody else do, do you know what i mean it feels like the same is happening in music that 
one or two people are allowed to get through. And it's like Simon Cowell's influence and all these other kind of people that are like, yeah, there's talent, but can we make money from them? And that's become the basis of the industry of the, it's about the return. It's an investment. You are investing in these people rather than just supporting this creativity. I mean, it, it used to be that, I mean, pubs are well as another venue that have just been obliterated. I think we're on 22 a month of closing in the UK, the last statistic I saw. It's basically um, one a day in it. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's mental. I mean, there's five nightclubs a week shutting as well uh, at this rate. In, uh, five a week, no, five, five a month, I think, five, uh, nightclubs are shutting in the UK at the minute. Um, it's it's terrible. I did the math on the uh, grassroots venues. I think we're down to about 850 uh, venues closing. Uh, I can't remember the percentage rate. We've lost 13%, I think, in the past 12 months. And at the closure rate of, I think it was two a day on average or two, whatever, two a, a week. Um, by the autumn of 2028, there'll be no music venues left in the UK. So, I mean, part of the thing could be tax your Taylor Swift, tax your Oasis, they're talking about how much money that that's going to make. Like that needs to be redirected into these venues. They're like Oasis. Look, it's is, not going to happen. But I mean, it was pointed out by the uh, music venue trust. Uh, yeah, music venue trust. The the Oasis's first tour in nineteen ninety six, the Supersonic tour, um, had thirty two venues, of which only eleven of which are still open today. And they were all venues, un like quite underground or small niche -ish venues that took a chance on Oasis that then they became this national success and they were rode that wave, as we spoke of earlier, of like that late 90s Britannia kind of thing. Um, and where's the next Oasis going to play? Do, do you know what I mean? Where are they going to be able to to formulate that? We, we have severed this generational it'll, connection. It'll just, just, it'll just be AI. It'll be an AI song. It'll be an oh, AI God, artist. Oh. I'm not, I'm not even joking, mate. I know you're right. I know, and I just not even like, thought... I was just like, but people like... like that's, that's more like 15, 20 years down the line or something, but, but it's... Um, we're living, we're living in the time of like the strongest and most powerful wealth vacuum ever. So when you say we need to tax them and give them money, that's just, it's just not going to happen. Right now, the main agenda is to extract all the money from the working and middle class until you can force them on a digital credit system. So digital ID systems, um, none of this is going to happen. Like all, all these, all these big, big arts council charities and stuff that used to exist, they've all, they've, they've all got so much less funding than they ever used to, and they've all, they've all got to. Um, They've all changed how they do it, and you know a lot of these a lot of these things just aren't going to happen over the next years. Yeah, so we need to do it grassroots, and it, need, and it needs to be like it needs to be for the passion again. Like grassroots venues can't exist like fun, uh, supported by volunteers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, which is mad. It's, it's mad that like the, yeah, in, in a world filled with so much money, um, yeah. how how we've got to we've, we've, the the answer is just straight volunteering. But that's that's it. You got you got to create the culture outside of the capitalist system. The capitalist system is all based on the money. So you've got to be willing to do stuff for passion and for free to, to make any kind of difference. Um, but equally, we need to get that money back. Like that's, that is another problem. We need to find a way to get this money back to equalize. I don't, I, I don't know how to stop the billionaire problem. mate. like, don't even want to <laughs> yeah. suggest any answers for the billionaire problem It is the biggest and most complex problem. I think humanity's ever faced, but it's basically a narcissistic, ep narcissist epidemic, <laughs> yeah. narcissism and capitalism have just collided. <laughs> I, I don't know yeah. the answer. I, I've never, I've never managed to have an answer with a narcissist in my life. So I've just had to cut them off. So. <laughs> True, very true. I think it's we create almost a parallel economy and culture as we already do, you know, since uh, the Public Order Act 1994 and the whole banning yeah, yeah. of gatherings of 13 or more people with music characterized with a dum 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 beat. Like, literally, it's almost classist, racist bullshit written into legislation that we've had for a long fucking time. And obviously, I'm very much a, a student of drug policy, so I, I know these things. But it, it's weird that, as you mentioned, it's the class element, is that mm. we had this thing with people like Jamie T. I'm trying to think of other people around that time, who basically put on this like working class voice and persona, but they were all middle and upper class kids that were like really well educated and you know went to music and art schools and you know they learned theory first and then tried to become artists rather than they were artists that kind of just it, they were allowed to bloom they found found in themselves that ability to to get almost get out of their own way to produce their their, their work that they wanted you know um yeah. so do you think that then i mean journalism actually thinking about i think i read somewhere last year about 80 something percent of journalists in the uk are middle class or above and obviously that then sets the tone of what's in the papers and what we're talking about. So then this is dead, like detrimentally going to affect the evolution of genres of music. Because, I mean, we got Jungle in the UK because of Windrush. 
because of the Caribbean people bringing over the 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 like two step and the the dance hall and reggae and then the dub culture and how that then evolved and how people started to bring in technologies and play with it and all of that was done underground, like then it became popular and it was a it sprouted but it's like the mycelium you know the mycorrhizal networks of mushrooms and it's the the end genres that we see are the mushrooms that pop up but that ground stretches but as you say it feels like there is this this capitalist class war against the creativity of the underclasses because what they want to sing about what they want to draw attention to isn't what the 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 upper head the upper class the ruling elite sort of want i think of uh, Stormzy and when he did that grenfell stunt you know, he's sing, singing in the rain and he was like, saying, fuck, was it? fuck you, Theresa May. Do you think we forgot about Grenfell? Um, mm. Like, the artists, like, they can't, they have to hide that message and then sneak in and do a stunt, as it were, rather than their art being put on a, put on a pedestal, not even put on a pedestal, but being having the opportunity to be present and to be um, discovered by, by people on an even field. Do you know what I mean? Because of the nature of what their lyrics aspire to be. I mean, this was always the argument that they made about is NWA like a psyop in America where they allowing like gangster rap to proliferate because of the cultures that it, it created. Um, and I think there is something to this that they want to control culture through controlling music, through controlling the arts. And in this country, they've gone past controlling it. They're just going to fucking kill it. Just, just kill it. Just turn it off. They've got Netflix, haven't they? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I watched a Netflix film the other night that had like 95% on Rotten Tomatoes and I probably would have given it about half a star out of five, like maybe like 15% myself. Like, I don't know how they're getting away with these crit critic scores on these 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 absolutely god-awfully written movies, but um, yeah, like people have Netflix and even the supposedly good stuff on that is just brain dead. And I, I think I do think that is part of the agenda. There is obviously, we're talking about class war a lot and um, in a in in a war, especially where you can't actually kill people, because you know, which, even though they do, so through through various means of eugenics and uh, you know the amount of people that starve off the starve and die off the back of um, austerity and stuff, so they do actually kill people, but they can't do it direct. So they need a psychological warfare too to push the enemy down. The enemy being working class and soon to be middle class too. So watch out, middle class people, <laughs> yeah. you're going to be a target of the rich just as much as the working class over the next eight years. Um, but yeah, so the psychological warfare is a really big thing, and you need to exhaust people and not give them rays of hope, and not give them, and not not give them like expression and art and stuff. So yeah, I, 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 it's I think it's a big issue, man. Um, but through that, through that, um, suffering is also where you get things like reggae and hip hop. So sometimes you push people down, and it, it backfires, man. Like you know, so actually, I think yeah, that, that that is a wonderful. No, that's a very wonderful point, actually. That yeah, it's the underground culture is a response to the fact it's pushed underground. Mm. So yeah, it's and yeah, art is birthed of suffering, and yeah, I think over the next few years we're going to see some wonderful underground artists sort of could come out of the woodwork, as it were. I just hope that the stranglehold that we've seen on the meat space, as the youth call it, the physical world, um, isn't then is now happening on sort of the internet. That even if we can, you know, get on SoundCloud, we can get on Spotify, you can get on these platforms. Like you said, that the amount that you make from them is not you cannot sustain oneself on it. You know what I mean? And it's it's trying to get that exposure, but the algorithms are, are so fucked now. I mean, the Spotify business model is broken. It's you need to have a, a be a deal. You need to have like, oh, I've got a deal with an airline. You need all these other peripheral sponsors and other things that reciprocate with that platform for them to share. And I think like the 200 million Joe Rogan exclusive deal, the majority of that was about being able to place their adverts on his platform. It was not about the talent or anything else or the conversations or any of that stuff. It's all about the advertising thing, which, like I said, is now it's just numbers generated. And because of all the bots and everything, like the dead internet theory that's been sort of discussed, I think more and more every day, I believe it, that there's that we're not really interacting with people. You scroll through your timelines and where's the thousand friends I've liked? It's just sponsored thing, featured this, suggested this. Do you know what I mean? A post from someone I haven't spoken to in 15 years from 10 years ago. Like the relevancy of these things, like since Instagram and that lost its, you know, chronology when it would just post the posts in order, same with Twitter and other, other sites, we've lost this ability to discover new stuff where we can only ever discover what is what is fed to us. Do you know what I mean? And we're so fattened by the stuff that we're force fed that most people don't have the mental capacity to want to then, or even the knowledge to know how to use these platforms to find underground artists because even then they look at it and their brains are trained to go oh he's only got a thousand followers he's only got whatever and they'll go that must mean they're not good do you know what i mean people are so led by 
the numbers and the 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 marketing the advertising the slickness of it all you know they're the yeah they're just drowning in this simulacra of passion and culture and blind and deaf to the culture that happens around them but there's obvious answers and you know holistically healthy social media is 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 far from impossible it's just far from reality right now um you know there's there's so many so like you're saying the old the old instagram the old soundcloud they were so social but they also didn't make any money compared to what they make now um mm -hmm. So yeah, like it's an, it's another it's a every single al almost every single problem in the world gets answered when the billionaire problem gets answered because you won't need to make billions. You won't you won't need to make millions of company. You can literally just exist for the holistic health of people. Um, mm. it, it is the wealth vacuum thing that's so bad. But like I I don't know why I, if I had the time to do more journalism and research, one of my one of my big things would be like why don't these things um happen? Because there's obviously a hunger for it, right? Like. Everyone, artists, like underground artists, even mainstream artists, are absolutely sick of the Spotify monopoly, right? Um, they're sick and tired of it. Listeners, um, like us, not all of them, you know, some people do love this 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 homogenized culture without, without I'm sure if they if they found the route to the, the more diverse um, and autonomous artistic culture, they would like it, but right now they don't. But yeah, anyway, people like us would really, really want to see this app. I would, I would rather pay 15, 20 quid a month for... Um, a grassroots music streaming app that didn't even let me listen to major labels, right? That was and and instead of showing me the most popular stuff ever, would show me songs of zero play. So I had the chance to listen to an artist's song for the first time, be the first person to publicly listen to their song, etc. These sorts of apps could completely exist, but why don't they? Like, why don't they? Do they do they people start designing them and they get they get bought out and shut down? Do they do they not happen because they're not vi viable financially? I don't know, but yeah, I would. I mean, there was was it called Ello E L L O. Um, I think it was. It was a it was a social media site that came out around the time of Instagram's downfall. Um, maybe like two years into Instagram's downfall. I was looking at it and it was amazing. It was it was it was also had like a privacy commitment, so no data, no user data was ever gonna be sold. Um and the interface was really nice. It was quickly populated with small independent artists and stuff. Um and it just never really took off. I don't know. I don't. I don't really know why. It's, it might be to do with the um, dopamine addiction and the dopamine issues that have it. We have, that the whole human race has at the minute off the back of technology. Um, and that there wasn't enough dopamine in the app. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's sad. Yeah. It's sad to see these things actually exist, but they just don't get anywhere. Yeah. No. Great. I mean, there are millions of apps out there, and you say the people come to produce them. And I think it's the problem of our times. Is the result of as was an article published uh yesterday can't remember who did it my brain's arguing between forbes and guardian but i don't know it was basically discussing elon musk on track to become the world's first well that we know of trillionaire uh by 2027 and hmm. so the, the equation's quite easy as you say as he becomes a trillionaire where does that money come from they're not magicking out that out of the air yes obviously there is then capital generation under a digital system where they can actually add that to it through fractional reserve banking but in terms of then the the labor and the value that is the seed that makes that machine work like you know that's all stuck just stolen like you said that means that that middle class mm -hmm. are going to be the lower classes it's going to be that that suppression and division but i think that if if something isn't done to to, to sort that out it's look at it what elon musk has done to twitter you know like the there isn't the political inclinations of one individual and now determining like the approach of nations do you know what i mean i know it's always kind of been the way in terms of leadership etc but the illusion of modern democracy is that we have accountability we have you know um upper houses lower houses different parliamentary systems in place around the world to to ensure that certain things can't happen but these private companies and private corporations, as you say, have got us more addicted to them than, or I would argue are more addictive than opioids because everybody's fucked with them. Like, and there mm. is no, nobody can see the problem because the problem is a positive because it generates money. The average person spends 11 hours on the phone. Oh, well, that's good. How do we get it to 12? Do, do you know what I mean? The, the, it's gone mental and nobody can seem to see the, the, the problem. And like I said, because we're all walking down and scrolling on the phones, we don't see the loss around us. Then when we look up and go, wait a minute, did we have a butcher's there? Wasn't there a music venue there? Did, did, what happened to the three pubs? What happened to the, what happened to the, the physical space is gone. And it's part of it, like you said, it's because then you, they'll go to the physical space and people just sit there on the phones. And it's like, you, you've got to come here to socialise and to spend time with, you know what I mean? But 
the addiction is so strong that we can't break those bonds. You know, I mean, we're driven to each other. We're social creatures. We want to be in each other's company. But fuck me, we've got brought in digital checkouts. Yes, partially to save the big companies money, but because we don't even know how to look each other in the eye anymore and say good morning. Hey, yeah, you all right? Chat about the weather. Oh, thank you. Cheers, do you want a bag? No, thank you. Like, do, do you know what I mean? We, we can't, if we can't do that, what, what chance do we really have of, of rebuilding this? So I think the challenge is a global one, a national one, a local one. But as you said before, it first starts with the individual. We have to restrengthen it's the, it's the these only thing, It's the only thing you can really change. I mean, yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can change the world with legislation, but you, uh, the only thing, like, it's, yeah, the only thing you can really, really, truly affect is yourself, and it's the most important thing to change, anyway, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. There's, there's been there's been hugely influential people throughout the times that have massively changed the world too, but they didn't get there without a lot of self work and stuff themselves. You know, like a lot of discipline and um, develop development. Yeah, the, 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 the pro- starts. yeah, the process gives you the end. That was a terrible way of phrasing this, but you can't jump to the end of something. You can't be step into a space and go, I want to be seen as one of the vanguards of this, or I'm the best. Like, if you want to be that, you have to fucking do the work. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise, you're just a poser. I mean, I can't, I've, I've been working on the language recently uh, for legacy culture as a way of describing what it is that we're really wanting to showcase. And what I've got in my head is a little graphic of a binary going lifer and tourist. You're a lifer of, of music and creativity. It's been in you. you. You've got the bug and it's what you do, regardless of income, regardless of anything, geographical location. You are on that journey of discovery and of the mastery of that craft. Whereas then there are tourists who then go, oh, well, Grimes probably, oh, I'm going to start dressing like this and I can pretend I'm a dirt and dirt and like, and want all the, the praise and the, validation that comes with oh look at you being creative and stepping outside yourself that must take us brave and you know like all of that we're doing none of the work that would earn you that that accreditation do you know what i mean at the end of the day i think it's that t- because we fake it till we make it on instagram or whatever do you know what i mean it's you you live your best life on instagram you're your most political on twitter you're your most business on linkedin you have all these fractured elements of who you want others to perceive you to be <laughs> that you never work on who you actually are that's a, it's a good point about the culture stuff, though, because that's that's that's. Um, I was chatting to Ben from Mighty Oak Sound System. We were talking about culture and culture vulture. You know, we're all a bunch of white dudes doing reggae and that. Like, who's who's a vulture? Who's who's part of the culture, etc. Et um, mm-hmm. And I think I think if you just look at the actual, um, like actual real sorry real life culture, so like an actual an actual biological culture, it grows, it develops, it mutates along the way, and it spreads, etc. And if you plonk if you plonk a new organism into that, it actually gets rejected, right? Like. Mm. It, like it can be rejected and, not, and it's not a symbiotic part of, of that culture. And uh, it's interesting that that's the word we use to talk about artistic culture, music culture and stuff. And I, I do think that you, you can have a ticket into a culture if you've, if you've invested in it, you've been in it for time and you didn't let your ego inflate in the first few weeks you're involved in stuff, you know, and you've, you've, you've known your place as an apprentice, you know, and like, but these days people know people want this instant gratification and like, Honestly, man, people will write their first, first rap song and, and think they're like the fucking bees knees. And it's just, it's so dumb, man. Um, Mm. And you, you need to know that these things take time. I mean, honestly, some people like Dizzy Rascal. I'll never get over how amazing his first rap album was. It's one of the best rap albums ever. It's his first rap album, right? That's that is no short feat to be like maybe one of the top ten rap albums ever, and it's your first one you've ever released. Because a lot of these, like for me, I'm only feel like after twelve years and maybe eleven, ten albums or something, I'm starting to get to a point where like I think I'm actually pretty dope. Like, and it's taken so long to get here. <laughs> mm. I was, and, but he he smashed it in the first one. That's amazing. I, feel, I was so impressed by that. Um, yeah, but yeah, obviously, obviously he was there right at the start of grime, right? Like right at the very very start of grime. He's right in the middle of it. You know, part of the culture. Um, exactly, and that's it. It's he's the art that he has created is authentic of the experience. It's not from the outside looking in. It's not someone that's kind of come in and is doing like a a gonzo journalism kind of style of it. It's somebody that has immersed themselves in the culture because they care for the culture. And as you were talking about before about evolution and change and mutation and adaption, the, the yeah, they've become uh, one of the cornerstones of, of, of the institution because they really represent it because they've, they've built it. Do you know what I mean? Someone hasn't come in and bought it or, or adopted it. And then later on, somebody builds on that and moves forward. So I think that him producing the first album to be, one of his sort of best and then one of the best is because it, it captures the snapshot. I think if you looked at most of the best uh, subgenre albums, they are 
in the middle of the peak of the evolution of that thing from its roots into the next thing. And I think what people need to recognize in everything in life, like you said, it was a wonderful phrasing, you're an apprentice. And if mm. you look at then the Dunning-Kruger effect is exactly what you just described there. If you move into a space or into a thing and you think you learn a little, and you're like, oh my God, I know all this shit. But once you delve into mm. it, you fall down in confidence. And then over time, as you move towards mastery, you're building confidence. And it's because you've, you're have you not faking anything. Every element of it, you have done some work on. Do you know what I mean? You can run that, that what the hell's the event? Is it a decathlon where you do the 10 different things? Like you've practiced each sport. You've not just gone, I'm, I'm this thing. You've done all of the other the other uh, pro for work, and I think that's it's that authenticity that does inspire others. Like people may like Taylor Swift or whatever, but I can't see other than sorry, quite narcissistic white girls around the world being like, "I want to have the praise, the attention, and all of the again all of the good." They don't want to do the work to get the thing. They want all of the rewards of what they see in front of them. And I think it, we need to figure out a way in society to inspire what you have. Not you as in Jordy, you sat there as in you as not me. You as a person. No, but for sure. you know that, I mean? that, is, that is that is that is I was I was inspired, right? And that's that's what led me on what I believe to be like a good path for a person is to be passionate about their craft and never give up and keep keep striving forwards and stuff. And yeah, I do think I'm pretty dope right now. But when you mentioned the Dunning Kruger effect, and I also at the same time think at the first I'm also like, ah, I've got uh, now the road ahead of me is the longest it's ever it's ever been, even though I'm 12 years down it, right? Because I've realized the de- the depth and complexity of these things. Um yeah, for sure. There was a, there was another point. It's, it's gone now. So, but the, yeah, I, I went back to the Dunning Kruger and forgot forgot the, the rest of what you were saying. Um, That's all right. Sorry, we've both got ADHD, so we'll be forgiven for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we sidebar pretty hard there in the middle of a, a conversation, but I, that was some wonderful uh, discourse there, and I think we covered some good points about there being, you know, class issues, obviously logistic issues with the 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 money. Because I mean, the main thing is, I think it was fourteen million people tried to buy tickets for Oasis that shows that a lot of people want fucking live music. So it's, it's a logistical problem. It's not that there isn't a lack of demand. Uh, it's that the system is artificially deflating that demand. Um, well, there's, there's yeah. not 40 million people trying to buy like tickets for their local independent gig in one week. Like even if you include the, if you, if you, if you, so that you're talking about one, you're talking about one band, right? Yeah. You could include hun- hundreds of bands and there's not 40 million yeah. people trying to buy those tickets. Um, so it's not just the system, mate. Like it's we talk about this 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 wealth vacuum and that there is a cultural thing, and culture is made up of everyone's personal decisions. And you've got tons of tons of people personally deciding to follow the leader and not the underground. Do you think part of that is to do with social media? And I yeah, like because I my main thing is and music anything I go to, I'm not taking my phone or I've got my phone for emergencies or whatever. Ideally, leave leave the thing in the car to avoid well any done. temptation of wanting to capture the thing and or to be distracted by it because the point is to experience this thing. You can only experience it if you are actually fucking there. As soon as you're looking at it through the screen, you're already controlling your experience. You're already artificially affecting how it impacts you and it then becomes meaningless. It becomes for the, the praise that you're going to try and seek later. Like, oh, I paid extra money so I get to the front. Oh, you really want to see the band? No, I want people to see my selfie on the rail. Do you know mm. what I mean? That it's that kind of shit. The same like venues, it's, the people that they were only going to spend that money in return, not for the experience, but for what that looks like on socials. Do, do you know what I mean? I feel yeah, like no, that, totally. that's, just, that's that I'm, individual thing again that you were speaking of before. I'm just trying to work out if shallowed is a word, deepens a word, right? But like, yeah, like it's 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 the, mm. the it's a bit shallowed if it's a word. Um, I think made shallower is probably the the thing, but um. Yeah, no, it one hundred percent has has made things shallower. Um, the, but the the problem was all the problem was kind of already there. But yeah, go back to um eighties when you've got these raw punk scenes, these raw hip hop scenes and stuff. Um, you know, block parties and indie gigs that were absolutely packed. Um, and, you know, even in two thousand and eight, when I was a promoter, I was I was I was packing out some underground gigs. Um, I think I made like thirteen fourteen hundred pounds when I booked Skepta, but then I lost thirteen fourteen hundred pounds when I booked JME. Mm. <laughs> and that was that, that was a really interesting one because even though jme is like probably the better mc or no definitely the better mc of the two in my opinion um skepta was the more known one in that brief flash in the pan of, 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 of that that particular flash in the pan of grime mm. um skepta was more known and uh 
yeah, barely anyone came to the JME gig. There was a small difference in the way the gigs were promoted as well that affected it. Um, but yeah, that, that aside, like it was just interesting to see how you've got these two top tier MCs and one. So I broke even on, on the whole thing, basically. <laughs> Which I mean, for as we were speaking of before, like the kind of people now that are involved in this would look at that and go, wouldn't even consider it. They would never consider like, let's, all right, we'll deal with this one commercial, not saying either of them are commercial, but let's book, say, a big commercial uh, musician or artist that we know we can make the bank on, and then we can have three or four lost leaders. They wouldn't consider that. So now you've got so many venues, though, what venues are left, but they're just weeks of nothing, just, just empty fucking space because they are not wanting to, they'd rather not risk an expenditure and a loss to put on and showcase other talent and create a vibe that they just want that big thing. And like most of the people that are then investing and storing, because again, all of this is just about hiding fucking money. That's all it's ever been. That's all fine art is about. That's all the NFTs and anything we're about is about the rich figuring out a way to further avoid tax and paying their, their due share. And I think that now the same has become of, we know with movies. So there's been several movies in the past that were effectively just money laundering operations. And hmm. So it's the investor vehicle comes and it buys up this and it brings these people together and puts and that we're seeing that as you said with like the Oasis gig and the allegation is then made that I think it's Liam owes like twenty something million from his divorce and that was the thing that was able to sweet talk him round to the idea and it's just it's bollocks that again so the motivation of that the saying straight off the bat is money. It, it, it's, it's it's a terrible motivation, but equally the, the the very best the very best times in my life. So like two months in Japan filming. A month in Thailand with my girlfriend filming um, this tour that's coming up in Japan will probably be another top three. So that'll probably be the three best events of my life. You add that, add the expenditure of those three things and you're talking about 25 grand or something, right? Mm -hmm. So if if the, those, those, those are the, the best times of my life, emotionally, like leisurely or whatever, um, the times of my life where I've made the best art and they cost, it was very expensive, right? Um, so my motivation is the art. But sometimes I question if I made the motivation money and just stayed true and just kept the art in my in my heart. Like that might so maybe money can be a good motivation if your secondary motivation is good. It's based on my my, my long winded point here. Um, and I have considered I've considered tapping out of music because I'm 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 pretty able and um to like to to hyper focus on something. If I did hyper focus on money for five years, I'd be absolutely loaded. Like I could get a hot. A well-paid job. You, know, you don't even need a well, a well, well-paid job, mate. There's these, the, you know, like even just just hanging around on a building site, moving stuff around, can get you like twenty quid an hour, right? Mm -hmm. But these people that do these jobs, they they smoke cigarettes, they drink, and they take coke at the weekends, and they buy buy expensive first-hand clothes, and they've got nothing to show for their graft. Um, but they could equally eat cheap, which is actually healthier a lot of the time. Um, not drink alcohol because it's fucking extortionate and same with cigarettes like they're extortionate poisons why would you bother um you could have a little smoke up on the weekend it's only like 30 40 50 quid uh, for a weekend's worth of smoke you don't need to put tobacco with it you know it's and then and then you're, you're making so much money and you could be reinvesting that into art too so um but yeah i i, I sometimes think like i would like to tap out and just focus on money but um, I also think that'll be five years of making art loss. So I keep art the priority and just hope the money finds its way. I think there's there's an, a, an ancient adage that is basically, yeah, do what you love and um, the money will come eventually kind of thing. And I think you'll always find the way to do the art. I always find the way that the events or anything that I projects that I've worked on, if the inspiration and the passion is there enough, I'll just find a way. I never, know, I never quite know how, but you just, you just kind of do, and sometimes the this might get a bit uh, hippy dippy for the audience, but like I, I believe in like the synchronicity and the timing of the universe, and I feel that if you put 100%. out that energy and that effort, the barrier that you perceived was in front of you by walking towards it, it disappears. Do, do you know, or it becomes perspective into perspective. It looks like this giant fucking thing, and as you like move towards it, you realize, oh, there's a, I can just walk straight through it. Or like it's not a problem. It, it's and I think that's what so many people are they're scared to start and then they're scared to fail. But I, I, I there was a clip of Jim Carrey that really sits with me, always plays in my brain whenever I get nervous of starting a project or doing something. And it's him telling a story about him talking with his granddad and his granddad saying to him, Well, you know, Jim, uh, you can fail at something you don't want to do. So you may as well try at the thing you want to do. 
And it's if more people were driven towards the things they want to do, look, everyone's got to eat, so therefore they've got to make that money. So everyone would still be looking after themselves in a grander sense. But that creativity, that camaraderie that would be, would be found in that. So rather than us looking at each other and judging each other based on that value of what have you got to give me, it would be looking at each other of what could we collab on? What are you working on? Oh, that's cool. I've got this and I've got these things and I'm really interested in this. And if we'd all just be those passionate nerds about the things that, you know, warms the cockles, that the, the connects us to the human experience, society would be so much fucking better. And I don't know how yeah, to, no, to, to, to to adjust that other than my wake up was music. My wake up was local community and culture was just scrolling around, looking around and going, oh, this thing's on. Let's go there and talk to some people. Let's go there and experience what that is. Oh, there's an Afro-Caribbean full band on. I don't know, let's go check that out. Oh, there's this obscure Norwegian dude over from Denver. Let's go check that out. There's this, I was just putting yourself out there into that space. It's this stupid thing that we've been trained into of going, oh, you might not like that, so you shouldn't try it. Like, I'm not going to buy a ticket for that. I don't know if I like it. Well, you've already, you're doing it wrong. The experience isn't about liking it or disliking it. It's about experiencing it. Do you know what I mean? And I think we, we we need to figure out how to bring that back to the people. And personally, I want to see another summer of love and free parties and a big hmm. return to. I mean, it's one of the things we're doing in Durham. Durham police are, touch wood, are, are being very friendly with me at the minute. I'm allowed a sound system down at our regular events and we're looking towards doing... That's it. We were talking about doing a a, a comp what did we call it a complimentary clash rather than a like a sound clash in the old school style of like champion sound and who wins was setting up a bunch of rigs into the field and was basically doing a bit of prior coordination and just having like complimentary sound and so going from sound and going through the evolution of different beats and music and just playing with it obviously with then the cannabis event and various food stalls and just a big social space that is just cultural i just want to do cultural events free pop-up fucking cultural events and i think police and councils and other spaces they will allow more of more of these things to happen if people just come out of the woodwork and just fucking do it get 20 of your mates together and, and contact the council figure out the local ordinance how loud can you have it put it two decibels less how many people can you have have one person less do you know what i mean like we need to get back together because it's in each other's company that we find meaning do you know what I mean? There is no purpose to my life if I live alone and never get to talk to another person or experience anything. Because then I experience something. Who the hell do I get to share it with? Who am I going to go home and go, oh my God, this thing happened. Do you know what I mean? We we need each other. You know, no man is an island. Some may be peninsulas, but no hmm. man is an island. I felt a lot like a peninsula over the years because I've, str I've struggled with finding that team ethic and that, that, that group thing. I, I don't know if it's like the genres I work in or my personality or what, but if I've, 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 I've struggled to have like a close-knit Team like the Wu I would love to have like a Wu Tang group, mm. like like tons of people that are on the same on the same target, working together and uh, collaborating and that. But um, I have been a bit of an island. I like, mostly working with producers over the internet, and uh, yeah, one of my my community is the answer to so many of our societal problems. Yeah, one of my one of my future dreams is to is to have like a physical community and then like an extended community and stuff, much much more so. Um, but a lot of that right now is over the internet, which is a good thing. Like it's a good thing that it's there. Like I've got friends and connections all over the world from from. IRL traveling and and uh, music connect collabs over the internet etc. Like like that producer from Germany. Like I've, I've done two two gigs in Lindau. A third that I went to in lockdown that was cancelled because of the rain. <laughs> but you know that's like an, that's another one of my extended families over in this little island in Germany now through through collaboration over the internet. So the internet is, can be really really good for that. You've got um, big movements like the Greater Reset, um, which are based on the internet to connect people that want to fight against globalism etc. So. Um, you can find those answers on the internet, but equally, like I've read, there's a, there's a book by the guy that started um, the Occupy Wall Street movement called uh, the the End of Protest, and his, his his conclusion of the book is basically move out the cities and move to the countryside and start a community, and that's you know that's it's one solution, but then you also leave the cities devoid of people that actually care. If everyone that actually cared moved out the cities just to try and start these mini communities, you'd move all the people that care out of the cities. No one would be protesting. Total, complete totalitarianism would happen and then it would invade this countryside like it did when the British working class were made um, by, inv by changing the rules and regulations of the countryside so peasants can forage, uh, poach, like uh, hunt, anything of like this and they had to go work in the factories and that. Um, that'll just happen all over again. So yeah, I'm, I, again, I, I don't like to talk too much about world solutions because that's such a huge subject. But um, uh, it, yeah, community is definitely part of it anyway, is the point. Yeah, no, agreed. And I... I the reason I've done so much 
traveled so much and really involved myself in so many different spaces is similar sort of um, thought process and experiences you just described there. I think a big part of that is the neurodivergent aspect and element of it mm. is the the way in which you will connect, you'll find your tribe, as they say, and the reason that you'll have this affinity and family around the world is they, they get they get you, you know what I mean? But then it's this horrible, isolating feeling of being surrounded by millions of people on your own little island. And, Don't get you. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. the thing is, mo yeah. most, most of them can on a one-on-one -on -one thing. This is what I discovered when I took, obviously, we'd take like, quite a lot of ecstasy and other, other drugs, and we'd just end up chatting shit into late mornings and early, uh, late nights and early mornings with people. Most people can get it one on one, but there's something in your kind of your neurotypical brain that there's like a default setting there that they're they're just inculcated into, and they're just a good little capitalist and the good little shift worker and the good and they can rebel against it and they can have that humanity, but they are unconscious to it. And I recently learned somewhere it's somewhere between like thirty five to forty percent of people, only thirty five to forty percent of people have an inner monologue like hear their own voice and like actually have a like an internal world as it were which is fucking can I be one of them terrifying to me <laughs> can, I, can I be one of them my inner model like is too much <laughs> yeah, and, but that, that's the, i think it's you if you have that connection to it and that's where we're getting this whole thing of over diagnosing depression anxiety and uh, other conditions is that no you you're separating basically conscious and unconscious people and i think part of it comes to the drugs you use so yeah do you consume nicotine a cyclical psychosis inducing substance that requires uptake every couple of hours otherwise you get hyper aggressive that's the what happens to most fucking smokers a couple of ta ta hours without a tab they're gonna fucking eat somebody to have a cigarette alcohol as we recently have been discovering is a what they call a neurological retardant and suppressant if you moderate, mo yeah. mo moder moderately drink to like what is it three or four times a week so two or three drinks a, a, a night three or four times your brain is never not under the effect of alcohol. It's never not slowed. Your neurological pathways are never not suppressed. You then do that for 30, 40 years. Yeah, you're not going to suddenly have that revelatory experience at a rave somewhere that actually I'm going to go and change my life and go and do this thing. Like I think that there's something to that. And then with, again, the entertainment system, if, if you're dampening that thought process, all right, let's give them trashy TV, big emotive things. We'll manipulate them with music and credits and, and, and scores in, in films and TV and it's like a sim. It's this. They've created this simulation of reality that if you plug into it and you oh get all the things the Netflix and this and da, 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 that you don't have time to be a human. You don't have time to think for yourself because you've got so much entertainment, so much chewing gum for the eyes and the ears and the soul. Do you know what I mean? Just just crap that just just lactates and just that's it. It doesn't do anything. There's no satiation of the the hun hunger and the want for meaning, purpose, connection. Yet then on the other side, oh, yeah, you've got yeah. all these isolated people around the world in their bedrooms talking to somebody 10,000 miles away, nerdily like, oh my God, dude, you get this thing too? That's amazing. Fucking da -da -da -da. And it's I don't know the answer of how we make the digital physical, but I do know that it means more when it's physical. Like if we were sat in the same room having the same conversation, our heart beats would start to synchronize. There's a project in America called Heart Math where they've basically been working out on the, of all these things that synchronize between humans in an experience. Like we start to reciprocate behavior, tone, syntax, everything would start to slow to one. We see this in people. They say, oh, you're mocking my accent. It's like, no, I've unconsciously picked up on that's where you speak and I'm trying to reciprocate and make it, do you know what I mean? There's, there's everything in us is geared towards wanting to learn each other, be each other's keeper. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing in us that really is designed for anger and, and, and violence. Like, uh, we're flimsy. You know, we have contact. We have to wear gloves. Our hands break. Our faces break. We're not like the fucking rammed horns that are designed to, like, smash the crap out of each other. We're supposed to talk. We have linguistics. We have a frontal cortex. We have all of these other uh, abilities and senses that surely should evolve us beyond that raw animalistic thing of, that's my fire. That's my woman. That's my food. You know what I mean? But a lot of the, the the propaganda is geared towards that lizard part of the brain massively. Um, mm. the 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 invention of psyops and PR etc. by Edward Bernays was all based on that Freudian psychology and the lizard the lizard brain etc. Um, and uh, mate, yeah, what you're talking about like um hum, being a human, and what is being being a human is is being part of nature. And you know, you take take one part of a bike off like a brake lever, it's fucking useless, right? That's basically what we've done with like with this, this part of this massive symbiotic machine, and we're just like a bunch of brake pedals hanging around with a, with a, a, a massive collection of bikes without brakes or whatever, you know. Like, it's, yeah. uh, 
Body analogy off the top of the head. <laughs> it was good visuals you know in my saying? mind as you were talking. Out. I you know that. what I'm saying? We, we, we were part, we're part of a beautiful machine, but we're because because we mostly separate ourselves from it, but uh, both ourselves and the machine are suffering greatly. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so aside from, aside from community being one of the key answers is a uh, connect connection with nature. My um my stepmom works for a charity that's bringing beavers back to England, which is beautiful. Right. You know, there's this, there's this whole. It was one of my favorite movements I've heard of since I first heard of it. Is rewilding, like bringing bringing species mm-hmm. back that are still alive in the world but not in the areas where they should be um it'll it'll start with an experiment in the yellowstone national park where they reintroduce wolves and everything just fell back into place because the wolves moved the deers the deer stopped overgrazing the plants increased which went to which meant more roots in the river which meant salmon life got better so the salmon migratory system got better than the, the, the salmon migrators migrating up the river had a, had a not an effect on the ocean health it's so, so it's all these um but i want to see i want to see a rewilding charity for humans or something i want to see a way so the, the way that you can send these city dwellers these these screen addicts from whether they be child, children or adults, and um, should, obviously should be compulsory, but it should be highly uh, advised that, or like highly easy, very easy for people to just go and spend like a week or two in a hut with nature and fi- crafting fire and stuff. Like because it's, it's we've lost we've lost that part. So yeah, two of the two two of the three, three biggest answers and things that I think are important. Are, yeah, community, nature, and art. Yeah, hundred hundred percent, hundred percent. You made me think of there. I think what is it called? The was it the spa movement? And it was sure. uh, uh, basically when the, when we invent, we had steam engines and trains and we had the industrial revolution and we were moving shit. And then in the early 1900s, um, oh, I'm trying to figure out which article I wrote this in so I can like visualize it in my head to get the thing. I think it was the guy, it was Thomas Cook who created like the package holidays and all that. And they basically popularized like passenger carts, carriages on uh, train tracks. And they would go and they sort of built like Brighton and places like that. Is because people out of the major industrial city of like hubs of like London and Birmingham and, and the Northwest and whatever, they would go to these spots like Blackpool and that, and they would have these spas and this. It was kind of like a back to nature thing initially, but then it became because of the the nature of the people that could afford to do it. It then became about luxury and like the glamping version of festival camping. You know what I mean? So they missed the fact that no, you need your feet in the grass. You need to be on the beach. You need to be. And this was like how the seaside coasts and all that were built. Was it was then doctors would prescribe it. You'd literally be prescribed beach time or go to coast time, and you would go and believe that like putting your feet in the salt water and like breathing in the sea air was good for you. And um, there was a movement of that because they recognised in society that there were all these pressures and all of these problems that were caused by the intense scaling up of human activity. You know, we'd gone from horsepower and, and ploughing in fields, and people were actually like ploughing fields one year, and then a decade later, like there were the mechanical world was just fucking there. We've done the same, but times 20 with the internet. You know, we have the technology of the 23rd century, potentially. Like, what if you look at where we should have evolved in terms of timeline, everything else is this amount of time, this amount of time, this amount of time. And then the first second, and I suppose now with the digital being the third industrial revolution, has just accelerated it. So our, we're not evolved to deal with the amount of stimuli. We're not evolved to deal with the the amount of fuckery that other humans commit to others in everyday life by whether it be the design of a park bench or it be the in your face advertising whether it then be the the manipulation of your social media it be of you know the gerrymandering of political uh districts or any of these things it's all just to, to disconnect you from that human experience of self you know what i mean and, but it's like then where do you go back to because i suppose in this country it's it's, it's, cheaper, it's cheaper to yeah but it's cheaper to fly 20 quid i can fly to ibiza it probably cost yeah, me yeah, yeah. 200 quid to get to the course. I can't even get to the course from a train on here. In yeah, 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 London, London, like the, Scottish, like... Scottish Highlands with fuel prices and train prices right now. It's really hard, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you you know, we, we call a... these... We... We call Sorry. these escapes like unplugging, and um, we do have that. We do have a limit as humans of how many things we can actually plug into. Um, but if you are plugged into alcohol, like you're saying, it dominates your brain for the entire week. And if you're plugged, if you're plugged into trash TV, if you, you've got, it's, it's never going to run out. It's not like it's not like heroin where you can't afford the next hit. Like there's there's infinite shit yeah. you can do. I've, I've 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 had a reasonably bad habit of watching uh, a bit too much YouTube over the past years. And um, although I've managed to get a degree and make two albums in that time. I might not have made more in that time, but I think my mental health would have been better had I not uh, what, like watched so much trash, watched so much YouTube and that. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, like I, I think it's important, and I think it's important to plug. To, if, if, for example, in my own situation, if I unplugged my my YouTube habit, I would I would I would plugged into an audio book or just thinking habit, my my mental health would be a lot better. And so this is the thing: if the, the, you only have so many connections, and uh, 
yeah, you might have, you might have the time or the headspace to connect with nature, but if you unplug from a couple of things, you'll be left with this free time and energy. It's like, oh, what can I what can I plug back into now? And if that is nature, your your life will get better for sure. I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would. So you're talking about glamping. I was never. I'm glad I remember that one. So that 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 resort I worked in, where I saved up to film dust, yeah. was um the most expensive resort in North America. It was like two three, two thousand something dollars a night. Um. And that was just the basic all inclusive package. But people, you know, rich people would come and they'd spend more and more and more. And this this is an ancient rainforest, clear quat sounds in, in Tofino and in, in, in on Vancouver Island. Some of the some of the only ancient trees were still there because of a really good movement from the natives in that area. Um so there's there's still some like thousands, like many thousand year old trees in this area. Um and yeah, but it's it's kind of like gate kept by this two thousand dollars a night. And you know, people people would be coming there. Uh, they'd be they'd be dropped off by their private helicopter. So I'm sat I'm sat in the field like in in shorts, my top off, smoking a blunt, and this this like I don't know like few hundred thousand helicopter just pulls up and lands next to us. And these this like Chinese businessman with his family get out, and it's like the third time they've been at the resort. They must have they must have spent like hundreds of thousands at the resort that summer. Mm-hmm. But the whole thing was like the whole the whole experience was like um, yeah very very expensive, very money based, and also quite quite cut off from nature. Not completely cut off from nature. They were staying in a tent in a rainforest. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 not the re- it's not a real um they never they never took the hikes that I took in that area for example and I wasn't yeah. even paying to be there and you could also take those hikes for free if you could, if you could get a boat to that area you were allowed to walk through the land to do these hikes these these hikes up through the rainforest which take like a whole day and you see these massive trees and you've got a whole day of thought um and 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 smells and sights the whole all five senses connected with the nature again mm-hmm. and you know they but this 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 businessman he would he would just fly around in a helicopter and stuff you know what I mean it's like this this like monetary glass physical separation. Um, mm. from the nature so it's really interesting to see how these places for reconnecting the nature exist in but in this capitalist system but they're, they're like they've got this whole like not connected with nature aspect to them yeah it's it is it's so it's so weird and that even the idea of like w- that we go to nature like it, it's it's it, with the cities it's it, we treat it almost as if even in the language and our approach that these cities are somehow this thing that just ha- is and happens it's like no the, all of it was nature and then they, they built up from it. So the nature is still there. It's just under the fucking city. Do you know what I mean? There's still, like you said, the, we have uh, salmon will go back like tens of thousands of years to ancestral homes, like in generation after generation after generation. You have it with the, the genetic memory, the blood memory within these creatures of knowing that their ancient traditions and their, their, their habits and rituals. I mean, we're starting to understand so much shit. The more we're using, in a good way, AI to like map uh, the linguistical patterns of different creatures, you know, and we were able it's to... amazing, isn't it? We'll be, maybe we'll be, we'll be talking to whales soon. Like, we'll be able to talk to whales soon. This is the thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really, it's also really important to remember, like, all these talks about how fucked up the world is, blah, blah, blah. Like, um, the billionaire system might be so greedy that it eats itself, right? That's, that's, that's so many I'm lyrics. I'm very that, much hoping so, yeah. <laughs> so many lyrics that I've, I've written about stuff we're talking about. I should have just interjected every time to say the bars, but <laughs> yeah, the, the, <laughs> the system's so greedy, it, eat, it will eat itself. So, um, I'm, I'm willing to wait for that, especially whilst simultaneously there is other things happening, like the, the ability to communicate with whales, like and ask them what they think or what they what they know and et cetera, and find out about their their culture. Like whales have culture, like the, mm-hmm. and elephants do. Elephants have a name for every different elephant in the tribe, mm-hmm. et cetera. They're they're well aware of when one gets died. They grieve. They mourn. They almost they sometimes have funeral possessions. They also have a potential religion. They have a, um, elephants potentially have a moon based a solar a, sorry lunar religion. Um, where they go to certain time, certain places, and do certain things depending on the moon, etc. Um, like we we might literally be able to communicate with these 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 animals in in, the, in this this uh, century. Like yeah. so, this <laughs> and there is there is people trying to clean up the great gar- garbage patch. But um, what's the statistics of that? It's um two per two percent of the revenue in one uh, of, of one year of um, plastic manufacturers can clean up the great ocean garbage patch. Zero point five percent of the top ten richest people. Um, uh, like revenue could could clean up the great great uh, Pacific garbage patch, etc. Yet there's there's, there's a charity like scrambling for donations and funding from the EU to get this done. Um, but I know that's a, that's a, it's a good and a bad thing. It's bad that they just can't just happen like that. But it's good that it's even happening, right? And I just I just don't want to be one of those people that just, just like thinks the world is shit and terrible like all day every day. Like um, and, you know, you chat to your friends um and about the world and the majority of it is oh it's bullshit it's fucked but like just just it's there's still so much beauty and still so much human goodness and so much good art and stuff i just think it's really important to remember that for everything um and keep it keep it as the light in the tunnel not just at the end of the tunnel the light that's in the tunnel we're in don't just be like oh you know this future world could be better remember that there is beauty in this world right this second too yeah yeah 100 percent. and the tunnel gets shorter as soon as you recognize the light 
it's it's something I've always had. People have often called me like uh, a pessimist or something. I'm really negative. Oh, you're pissing and operating. I'm like, you can't experience this as I am. You hear me say these things and you feel bad. I see this as I'm discerning reality. If it is what it is, it's not negative or bad. I can see mm. it is obviously bad in the, but I don't feel it. And then, so it's, I can't remember what law it is. Is it Faulkner's law? There's a whole list of the, the classic laws in my brain. But it's basically, if you can articulate uh, clearly and articulately write down an idea, you have already solved half of it. And um, I see that as the way I view the world. If I can clearly and non-emotively see what the fucking problem is, then my emotive mm. goes to the other side. Now I know what it is. I'm on the up. Do you know what I mean? I've dealt with the bad because I've, I've rationalized what it is. I can see what the fuck it is. Now, where do I put my, me into it to put the good into it? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Just into like focus on the light that's coming in. And then with every step, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And then through your efforts, you'll increase the luminosity of it. Like, and, and it is that training that atrophied muscle, as we spoke of before, that attention follows, aw no, awareness follows attention. So whatever you put your attention to, your awareness will, will linger on. So if, as you yeah, said, your, thoughts, your, your, thoughts and actions treat each other in this circle. You think, you yeah. act, you think, you act, like, and you, and you, and uh, in each of those like parts of that semicircle, you can, you can, you can make a decision and change your thought yeah. or change your action. Hundred percent. Yeah, you. It's it's the quantum experience of, of being human is wonderful. That there are things that happened to me in my thirties that re uh constitute and help me re and like really understand things that happened 20, 30 years ago in my life. Like it's with not this linear thing of just this, then this, then this, then this, then this. It's all mashed together, and there could be something you you thought about from twelve years old, thirteen years old, and it just it's lingered in the back, and then at forty, all of a sudden, but you've done. You'd look back, and then you see, oh, actually, that step led to that step, led to that step. It's the Seren Kierkegaard quote of, uh, you know, life can only be understood backwards, but has to be lived forwards. If you can consciously come to retrospect. If yourself, I mean, I try and do it every year. I go to the woods, fire, bit of DMT, bit of MDMA, whatever it is I choose to do. And I use that time to quiet and to dis disconnect, to unplug and to choose to like almost in a meditative state, look down the timeline of my life at what I've come through, mm -hmm. like really be grateful for where I'm maturing, where I'm growing, where I'm bettering myself to be able to then without that judgment or that negativity to look forward to then where do I next year when I'm sat here, what do I want to be proud of? What do I want to see? And even just having that conversation, even if I don't go back in terms of a monologue, having that conversation again, when I sit there next year, I'll have achieved quite a few of those things because it's, you set that intention with yourself and it's, it's why meditation is so powerful. And med prayer is just meditation. I mean, we get in a sort of organized religion. I, I, I disagree with organized religion, but the conceptual idea of belief beyond oneself. I mean, I, I believe in in uh, that we're all one consciousness. You know, I, I came to a, a, a conclusion on acid years ago that if I was born you, raised as you, and lived as you, I would be you. Ego, there is only one consciousness. It just it, it expresses itself differently in each creature. That there is this universal thing that I want love, you want love, you want contentment, comfort, joy, you want to feel meaning, purpose, pride, value. I do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We, 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 we can see quite easily what we all need. I need to eat. You need to eat. We may like different things, but we need the nutrition. There are these universal things that, that connect us all that we have to come to awareness of together. They're never going to educate us on this. They will never provide us the means to liberate us, ourselves from their systems. And like I said, art is one of the most important ways, whether it's poetry, writ the written word, whether it's performative, whatever it is, anything that you can do to beyond just the simple uh day-to-day -day linguistical communication form a way to reach another person to you know tap into their soul and you know tickle the heart a little bit and go oh shit and see beyond and dig, drop out of that default mode network that's why drug prohibition has been the way it has and now i think art prohibition is effectively what we're living through you can have a banksy <laughs> but only only because banksy makes millions do you know what I mean? It's it's. it's I game. mean, I could, I could, I think I could technically, I think I could technically be sent to jail for some of my lyrics right now, but I won't be anytime soon. But mm -hmm. I think, I think that there is now the legal legislation in England is to send, and I won't, I won't, I won't hand them the golden ticket and tell them which lyrics. But, yeah. um, like, I think, I think there is the legal legislation in England right now to put me in jail for words in my songs. Um, which is absolutely wild. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm, you know, I'm gonna do next time I get a podcast. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get my own notepad because I have so many thoughts, and so many things. Good idea. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna jump back a second though to um, the the self development stuff and uh, I've I've one of the things I'm proud of myself uh, these days is is getting more control over my uh, emotions and, and knee jerk responses. But 
I had, like, I had a huge knee jerk response because I watched like 10, 15 minutes of the BBC News yesterday. Oh. And I, was, I was just raging because it was just so <laughs> bad. Such brainwashing bullshit, skirt the real issues stuff. And I'm like, this goes on every day, all day. And most people in this country are watching it. It's like, no fucking wonder we are where we are. And no fucking wonder. Um, I'm just thinking of a way to phrase this. Um, friends of mine were murdered by the thing that they took because they were told they should. Um, and uh, yeah, like dead friends, right? And dead friends of friends, quite a lot of them now. Um, because of that propaganda machine, right? And anyway, that's that. That was the main thing. So it was, it was the grief coming back up, right? It was it was it was, it was mourning and grief coming back up, and it, it, it and a few other people died during that time um, because of the, the the psychological effects of it, the mental health problems that it caused. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever know a guy called Yusef Nadim? He did hang out in, in in Durham a little bit. He was a bit of a you hung around the northeast in various places, but no, but Nymph he sounds rest, familiar. Rest in peace to him. But yeah, he 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 committed suicide during um. Every the time everything was locked locked down and that yeah and that was and there's, and there's just so many different people that die but it's, the the that that happened because of the propaganda machine in it the power of it people believing in the story that was being told um and it was really really it was I was I was really raging and maybe that rage is a good thing like I can transmute it but I'd also I'd me moving forward I'd like to be able to control these things and be like right I feel I feel angry what is it and, and put it aside a little bit because yeah um it's it's really it's 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 good to feel in control. And sobriety has really helped that too. So we're talking about alcohol affecting your brain all week. Like I've, I, I, have, I rarely drink, and I've been drunk maybe once a year maximum on average for like eleven years now. And every single time, I was like, "What's the point of that?" Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, self self control is 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 a, is a really important thing. I still don't have it. Like I was saying with YouTube and that man, like I still still just like it's got a spare hour or two, and I'll just watch a rust video for like the like a different one, a new one. But it's like you know, I've seen I've seen hundreds of them. I don't need to see any more. <laughs> It's it's difficult because then we trick ourselves. So I'll sit writing sometimes I'll be like three thousand words into something and I'm like, oh crap, I've just watched like season one of House. Like or something stupid. Something I've seen like in the past and it's just I'll just put something else as an extra. And it's like I almost feel like I can't think unless I've got the extra thing. And then it's so I can have the yeah, break yeah. of I've just finished a paragraph. I'll watch a second of that. I'll do this, I'll do that. like we've been we've trained ourselves into this and it's not our own it is our fault. It's our responsibility, but not our fault. I think I'll send you, you say- um I'll send you a chill I'll send you a playlist that I've, I've developed to help me with that. It's quite it's like a quite a long playlist, but if I need to write um or do other other t- tasks that don't like when I can't do it on video editing, right? Because I need the audio, but anything that isn't like that, um, like writing or or, or building something or whatever, like there's I made this playlist of really peaceful music that's that's managed to it's it's it, it somehow managed to stop me wanting to watch something as well. Um, it does it helps a lot. Nice, nice. Yeah, because it's like it's the two parts of my brain. It's as soon as the only way I can almost re- re- maintain that conscious hyper focus, if it's something I'm not a hundred percent already overtaken when it's like automatic and organic, is that I've got yet yeah, the other thing that I'm kind of controlling and the the layers to it. But it's it is it's it's a weird thing that um it we like I said we're we're responsible for how we react to it but it's not our fault that we react the way we do. They have spent billions. They have invested loads. You talk about Ed Benares before and like Freudian psychology and everything that happened with like Jung and Adler and the the weaponization of this whole intellectual movement into capitalism. And yeah, It's past its 100th birthday as well. It's been going on for 100 years now. And then you've you've, you've had the technological advancements in the past, past uh, 30, 40 years. Exactly. So we're, we're kind of screwed in some way. So it's, I don't blame anybody and nor should anybody blame themselves for struggling with anything. It's harm reduction nowadays. Like that's the best you can do. You're going to be addicted to something in this life. Find the thing that reduces the harm the most. Like, you know what I mean? If you're watching like loads of TV or whatever, then uh, don't watch, like you said, try not to watch like mainstream news. If you want to be interested in other subjects, look at the entire network and there's huge networks on all the political spectrum across the Overton window of more independent media. That is a lot. Shout, more. Out, shout out, James Corbett. James Corbett's my favorite journalist. Just if anyone's still listening and wants a good, good source of decent information, man. Like, yeah, nice. Like, yeah, we have to. It's, it's, it's last it, American it, vagabond. There's, there's so many of them, man. These, these people that just they've, they've worked from the grass ground up, and now, now it's their income because they're, they're good, good enough at what they do, and people support them. So yeah, like grassroots is so important. Just and uh, more people spending those first three, four years doing it for passion. Like you said, if you're passionate enough, the money will come. Um, yeah, hopefully it, it does for people. It's in that sort of the the McKenna sense of the, the the phrase of finding the others. 
that's what we have to do. It's the way we first have to find ourselves so that we can find each other. If I don't know who I am or what I am, how can I recognize me and you? If that makes sense. Mm. Do you know what I mean? How can I recognize what it is that I would have a connection to in you as a person if I don't know who I am? And I think that you're not, such... you're, you're not your avatar, right? And that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. something else that's been, been massive. Like everyone had an avatar before the internet existed, but um, like it's, it's called more, more just so called like the ego. Or there's, there's various words for it, but yeah, um, you're, you're a lot more than that. And in the, in the century of the self, which by the way is a really good Adam Curtis documentary, which is where yeah. it's the best account of the history of Edward Bernays. If you need to look into that, it's, it's quite long, but it's totally worth it. Probably one of the most important documentaries and probably the best documentary ever read by the BBC, funnily enough. They actually aired that. Um, but we're in the century of the self. We're in the century of neo. We're in the we're in the, millenn the century of neoliberalism and uh, it all being about like person, person, personal. But equally, like we're we're a, we're a massive part of nature that's been separated. We're a massive part of humanity, but we see ourselves as these these individuals again and again. And it's like, yeah, the 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 bike the bike energy I was using for nature and humans it applies for humans and humans too. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I think it's it's small things, and I think it's we have to get over our own self-defeating attitude. Well, I can't do shit, so nothing's going to happen. But if in some small way you do something, that incites... Yeah, everyone could, yeah, everyone could do something. Yeah, man. Everyone could do something. Everyone, everyone has something that they'll they'd actually enjoy doing that would contribute to the benefit of the world. You've got people that like, got people that like helping people and people like cooking. Great, go work in the soup kitchen. You've got people that like have these hyper-focus when it comes... Like myself, make, making music, writing lyrics that, that can encourage positivity, etc. Like... Just, just find, find, know who you are. Like you're saying, really important, and then, then work out how that can help the world. Ikigai is the the Japanese. It's, it's actually really good that that's been kicking off recently because one of the main elements of Ikigai is uh, like it's like what you're good at, what brings you money, and what's good for the world. Like it all crosses over. Um, it's a J Japanese book that came out about the Japanese um, philosophy of Ikigai, and it seems it seems to be spreading quite well. Like I've, I've actually seen like quite a few people just round about just reading the small Ikigai book, and it is it's it's, just, it's about finding what who you are. What you do, what you can do, what you what brings you pleasure, and what brings you money, and what helps the world. Um, I don't necessarily know if the money thing, but that is is that necessary? But like I was saying before, um, money isn't as all or as bad as people make it out to be. It's it's like the, the billionaires have made money a problem, not money itself. Just like a murderer makes a gun a problem, not the gun. Yeah, the the, the addiction to money is the problem. Money allows you to to eat. It allows for financial security and for you to have the the opportunity to pursue create creative uh art forms which i think is why we see the gentrification of art art artistry whereas before a lot of the like the working class kind of musicians that would then rise is they could afford the rent and to be able to do a few pub gigs and whatever and just pay just enough just to scrape by to get through that like you said the first three four years of of, of actually seeing if that is your thing of actually connecting to it and really putting in the passion and moving towards mastery um the yeah it's I think that's the only thing that we can do right now is that once everyone recognizes themselves, we'll automatically start seeing each other rather than we just all walking around and as the youth are calling each other, like, oh, NPCs. Everybody's a playable character and everybody's playing, man. There's a term, I think it's it's Sonder. Sonder and so this, it means that like the sudden awareness of the complex inner workings and nature of another human being. When you suddenly look at another person and go, holy shit, everything I am and have been through, they have. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah, that overview. It's slight, slightly personalized, slightly personalized, slightly different way, but it, it is all it's all the same. It's like we we only have so many emotions and stuff. I do I do find some people pretty hard to comprehend and empathize with when when they've mm. they've really lost their mind or they're really not narcissistic. For example, it's very it's very hard for me to see myself in 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 those people fully, but I also definitely see myself in those people partly for sure. Because like you say, we're we're all part of the same the same coin, the same piece. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's been quite quite a nice inspirational section for people that are going to now hopefully go away and start working on themselves. Um, I wanted to spend sort of the last bit of the podcast, if it's all right with you, talking about yeah. uh, obviously the upcoming tour, uh, the dancehall mashup album. I have to keep using the word mashup. I'm not in the industry, obviously, so my nomenclature is quite poor. Uh, just <laughs> in my in my brain, that's what it sounds like because it is it is it's it's complimentary. It works. Don't get me incredibly works, but like. The, the rigid nature of how my brain works i'm not musically inclined i can kind of just about decipher what, what sounds i'm hearing but i'm just more like yeah this is this is fun i'm enjoying this kind of you know I like I mean, have, you listened, have you listened to much dancehall have you, uh, do you know much dan dancehall itself because I, I, I actually almost i squirmed when you kind of called the album dancehall and i was really i was really um what's the word um 
I was lacking confidence in giving it the name I gave it, like Geordie Japanese Dancehall. I'm like, well, it's not Dancehall. But it's like, what the hell do you call something where you've mashed up mm. so many weird things? So w- when I hear it called Dancehall by itself, I'm like, oh, don't call it that. I'm, it's not Dancehall. <laughs> I mean, like Dancehall, I mean, like, from my understanding of the evolution of the genres and sort of Dancehall no, was, it is. The, it's was, connected. The, was the breakout. Yeah. And so I don't know. It's, I don't it's, connected, it's connected to that era. It's, connect, it's massively inspired by that era. The productions are... Um, I, I I refuse to do a fake patois at the minute and have have always. Some people have told me I should, and that's done. <laughs> it's like maybe maybe I'll be further along because a lot a lot of the white um, reggae MCs in the UK that have got anywhere, they they're doing the fake patois. And uh, mm. but I'd rather I'd, I'd rather champion me and Geordiness, right? Like yeah. basically. So I I don't think I'll ever do that. And um, there might come a time where I, I go to Jamaica for a week and I come back but back like M dot R. But um, for now, um. I'm pretty, pretty happy just doing Geordiness. And uh, I don't feel like a genre has to be locked by an accent or a skin color either. Yeah. Like, um, and it's, 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 it, for me, it's quite embarrassing seeing these people that, that like could be championing their, 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 their own roots um, and bringing it into the culture and connecting it to the culture they're a part of rather than just trying to replicate the culture. I'd like, I'd like to see more innovation, not replication. But yes, yeah, when I call it Geordie Japanese Dance, it's, the, it's the, the best name I could come up with to describe it. And I just wanted people to be, and to, to also, I, I thought that it would peak peak curiosity as well. Like, what the hell's that? So that that's where that name, name comes from. Um, but yeah, hit me questions about the album and the tour itself, and I'll I can oh, spill I th- more beans. Yeah. Um. So I think we were talking before. Uh, I'm I've half got your bio in my brain there that I was reading earlier. So is it you when you after you done the video on that in Japan? Is it you then went Thailand or New Zealand? Um, New Zealand was the first place I went traveling that kickstarted the whole travel bug. And also when I listened to Trinity Roots, which is who Trinity Lo-Fi is named after, it's a New Zealand reggae Maori roots band um, that massively inspired me to make music with a message. Um, I know I've, I've listened to reggae for so many years, but but their music literally shifted my soul and being to a better place. Um, I just I, I wanted to hopefully pass that off. Um, in, in hindsight of the 12 years I've been making music, I think I need to maybe be more instrumental and like one of the things that they did was wasn't just the lyrics it was the compositions um so yeah um that's a separate thing. but no I, I i got back from japan um filming that movie and i was going to go back to canada but i'd washed my passport and i had a I had a bit of a panic attack about it um i had a, I had a pair of jeans that i bought in japan with this like lush dragon embroidered on the back and it had five different jean pockets uh, my passport was in the bottom one so when i squeezed oh. the pockets at the top before yeah. i put it in the washer yeah and it just my passport went through and i probably would have been fine going back to canada with that but i got scared and i replaced it and then my my electronic travel authorization wasn't attached so i couldn't go back to canada to make to make the same money again in the summer i was going to go back to the same job and come out, out again with another 15 grand right mm. um and uh, I was I was so depressed after not getting that flight. I went to Gatwick with my stuff. They're like, you can't get on the flight with this this bloody passport, mate. Piss off. Um, so okay. I went back to Portsmouth and worked for Portsmouth Shitty Council for six months with a bunch of brain dead English gammon. Um, and uh, then I went to Germany, did some trees where I saved up for my own camera. I was like, right, I need I need a new camera. My old camera's not good enough. It's too big. So I bought I bought the Lumix GH5s and. Uh, and then I came back to England, um, and that was when things started shutting down. I was like, "Oh, well, we can't travel. I can't travel." So, I'm, and there's no way I'm taking the thing. Um, I'll I'll stay in England for twenty years if it means I, 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 if I don't have to take the thing. Um, and then I decided, with that much time to spare, I'd finally go to university because that's what gives you um, a route into long-term visas in like Asia and stuff and Japan if you want to teach. But after university, I. Uh, 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 I, studied, I studied tree surgery so I can move to New Zealand and I studied university so I can move to Japan I don't think I'm going to do either of those things because I am I really don't want to work full time like mm-hmm. unless it's what I want to be doing and it's, uh, I, I would I would enjoy being a teacher in Japan and doing some stuff in my spare time but I'm, I'm completely obsessed with trying to make it my full time existence is the art and stuff now so I, I don't think I'm going to do either of those things um, I'm just going to really really try and make, make the music work so um, so after getting back from Japan I've mostly been in England to be honest and uh this grant from the Great British Sasakawa Foundation that's um, given us the money to take this album on tour in Japan because it is a UK-Japanese collaboration and that's what they fund. Um, it's one of the best things that's happened. It happened just at the perfect time, leaving university where I would have had to start thinking about getting my own house and job and stuff and blah, blah, blah. So it's a really good slingshot into hopefully doing this more full time. And I'd like to take this uh, second to announce something I haven't actually announced publicly yet. So you've got a world debut on this is the album Geordie Japanese Dancer will be coming out on 1988 records, which is a French label owned by bigger ranks. It's an amazing uh, pioneer of the vapor dub movement. Um, has a lot of good followers, um, really good, good, really good, like good community of that genre in, in France. And uh, hopefully my music will start to reach a few more people. Cause that's the thing I've struggled with most. Um, even if I just get like, 
instead of 150 views, like a thousand views on when a music video drops. I'll just I'll just be happy with that um as the next step. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for the exclusive. Do appreciate, do appreciate. Um yes, I, I, I'm trying to think back to where we kind of sidebarred earlier into all the other things that we've just spoke about. So <laughs> what then um so obviously you, you produced the album and that over here. Um recorded it so produced in japan ja- japanese producer made the rhythms and he's 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 a massive reggae fan and this is why it's like you know 70 80 percent of the rhythms the rhythms they uh they do adopt the dancehall drums to sequence etc so it's like that's where it is dancehall but then it's where other people say oh well, it's not dancehall because you're a geordie and you're rapping in japanese and <laughs> well, but, but yeah it's the genre is more of then in terms of the history of it, the naming of it it's like the history of naming cannabis cultivars you would name right. what you'd mash them up and then suddenly yeah. what happened it, no, after, that's it. What yeah, happened yeah. after a while is somebody just came in and went, I'm calling Billy Kimbo OG, yeah, etc. Yeah. You take, take yeah, OG yeah. Kush, Billy Kimbo. It's, yeah, yeah, no, it's perfect. Yeah. That's that's that's, that's the way I'm going to explain it, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to I'm going to explain my album album name like that. I don't know if it's going to be the genre name, but like, what the hell is this genre? It's like it's digital reggae rap. It's that's 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 it described literally, but it there's not a name for that because I'm one of the only people really doing it. And oh, and I've been doing it for about twelve years now, and there's there have, there's a couple of us, but most people that jump on reggae, they jump on it singing or doing patois. Yeah, well, it's yeah, the, it and it's almost like if you go back, you can map it. Like I said, of the dub culture, then arriving of then how that then evolved in like two two step, and then you ended with like a branch off in we became we became ska dubstep, music, yeah. and then you got you know, the, you went off and went in through the jungle, the drum and bass through a dubstep, and you can see it. It is a, 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 a one of those branching points of, of musical genres. So in a way of describing the music rather than, I suppose, the the MC or the lyrics on top of it, like the actual structure of the music, I think, yeah, it does, it works well to it, um, uh, to describe it. And I think what I wanted to really, I'm, I'm curious about is, firstly, how much Japanese can you actually speak? How the hell did you figure out how to say, pronounce these words in, in with... <laughs> Just still keeping your your natural Geordie twang, and then adding that the base level that you've got to your your singing, like the, 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 base, the base the base level is just the size of my my, my lungs and body, right? Like, oh, yeah. like you know, it's, the big people have deeper voices than that. Um, how much Japanese do I speak off the cuff? Like, quite basic conversational. Um, but my understanding of the grammar and stuff is a lot better than my vocabulary is. Um. So I, that's, that was why I wanted to teach. The, re- the reason I wanted to teach in Japan was so I could become fluent. So that is the target, but I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm willing to work full time for that goal. Um, and the goal of being a full time musician is, is a little bit higher than being fluent in Japanese. And becoming a full time musician might pave way to becoming Japanese. Um, mm. becoming becoming Japanese, <laughs> becoming fluent in Japanese. <laughs> I'm not trying. I'm not trying to become Japanese right now. But <laughs> um, so just a little bit. So the two two of the verses on that album were ghost written. It's the only time I'll ever I say it openly. It's the only time I'll ever use a ghost writer is when I'm trying to make a joy Japanese rap, and uh, I just want a couple extra verses to pad, pad the album out a bit. Um, but other verses I wrote myself, yeah. Um, admittedly, using a Japanese rhyming dictionary. So like I said, my um, coll- my vocabulary isn't very good. So I would like this. Let's take the one of the, the second last song, Amaterasu dub. Um, I which is what I, I just came up with the first line. Mori no nakani jinrui waheiwani. Um, in the forest, uh, humans look for freedom, right? And then I, I go I go into um, the the Japanese rhyming dictionary and look what rhymes with the last word of the line, and then I build a next find one that fits and build the next sentence of it. I right, did that for eight bars, mm. and then I switched to English. So I, I wrote that one completely myself, sent it to the feature on the uh, on the song, and said, "Could you just proofread this? You maybe change like one or two things, and then." Um, so that's this. It is possible with basic basic knowledge of Japanese to sort of piece piece the puzzle together. Um, but yeah, like if I'm if I if I meet a new person in Japan, I could probably go ten minutes before I'm like, "Oh fuck, get the translator out." Like maybe five minutes for some people, depending on what they're trying to talk about. Um, so not a lot, basically, and uh, but but because I've lived there and have studied it and listened to a lot of, I watch so much Japanese cinema and anime. Um, it's, 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 there's there's the space there to get fluent, but I just I just need the time. Yeah. Mm. So how how long have you been sort of learning learning the language? Because obviously you lived in twenty. It was a twenty eleven. You lived out twenty eleven. So I, I studied studied for a year before I moved out, or so uh, maybe a year and a bit before I moved out. Um. Mostly just just uh, on earbuds and not not a lot of paper study, um, 
I had a job where I could listen to something, so I was just listening to the same lessons on repeat, just drilling it in, drilling it in. Um, a bit like you know when you, you know, you're writing and watching TV. It's like the, with these ADHD brains, sometimes doing two things at once is the only way to do one thing at all. Yeah, entirely. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, well, if I had to like organize um, a fridge full of wild food for eight hours, which was my job back then, like I just, you know, I just listened to, as much as my brain could handle. I just listened to Japanese lessons on repeat, and then if if my brain got tired, I'd switch over to music. Yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, was it because it's something that I've heard that Japanese is, is quite notorious of a language, same to actually quite quite a few of the non sort of proto Germanic languages. The the conversational versus the structural. So what the, you're learning when you're learning that versus then you talk to a person and the way they actually use the language. Like the French are notorious for it as well. Like what you actually learn written down versus how the fuck they speak it. Did you was it like a did you find it difficult when you first landed like in Japan? It's not so bad like that, you know, man. Like, so where where English, Spanish, and French have tons of rules and they're they're, they're generally broken um, regularly. Um, Japanese has like a very Japanese like way. It's like a, it's a lot very less audience. rules. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot less rules and they're followed. Like yeah. sim simpl simplicity and uh, cohesion and obedience. Maybe that's not the wrong word. Um, and regularity, I don't know, yeah, but um, it's. But I think there's, I think there's two irregular verbs in Japanese, and then aside from that, there's two types of verbs, and they all they all get conjugated in the same way. So if I if I hear a verb that I don't know, uh, in Japanese, and I know the root of it, I can generally conjugate it to any tense, etc., because it's such a simple language. But if you go in French, Spanish, English. You, uh, you hear a verb for the first time, you know, and that's when you get foreigners saying "I ran down the street, etc." Or, or like mm -hmm. "I swimmed, etc." Because it's we've got all these we've got all these weird, weird, irregular ones, and um, they don't really have that over there. So it's like I've got a good foundation to move forward, like I said, because the so a lot of the rules are drilled in. You just got to get the vocabulary up, and that's the beautiful thing about Japanese. It's it's the it's it's quite easy to get going with it if you're not trying to read it for sure. Because mm -hmm. that's that's where the complication comes in. But there's a little bit of accent in Japan, like Osaka people speak a little bit different to Tokyo people than that, um, and they do have their own dialect. It's uh, it feels a little bit like Geordie to me, Osaka. Um, like it feels like a little bit like the Geordie version of of Japanese, the Osaka Ben. Um, Is Osaka no, where there's that? I keep seeing like stuff of Newcastle United fans, and there's like a yeah, because NUFC Osaka... went on tour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just a Japanese thing, man. I think I think NUFC. Did you know? So do you know that? Um, you can only spend as much on players in relation to your revenue made that year, which is why Manchester United have like one of the best teams because they sell the most merchandise, they have the biggest revenue, so they're allowed to spend the most money on players. It's something I found out recently. Okay. So I think when NUFC just went on tour in Japan, it was to try and boost merchandise sales so we can get better players in the coming years. Very, very clever little, very little good thinking that the businessmen yeah. have got over running Newcastle. We so if, if we could increase, if we could just increase strip sales, etc., over around the world, we can get better players. Um, but yeah, I saw that as such a good omen, you know. When when I was like, I was organizing this tour, and it was like NEFC are going on tour in Japan. I was, I, I, I believe yeah. it. I used to talk about omens and synchronicity and synergy, etc. Yeah. I was like, that is such a good sign, man. Like, and then also it was at the same time that NEFC were touring Japan. Wayne Wonder was touring Japan. He's like a uh, dancehall reggae artist. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So so it's yeah, man. It's but that's what I was saying about the Kierkegaard quote thing. If you can only live it forward, but you, you can only understand it backwards. Like it, it, you can see it all makes sense. It's like when you read a celebrity's like autobiography, and it just it's like this isn't real almost because everything leads to everything else. But in their mm. life, like they never they didn't have a fucking clue. They were just doing their thing. Do you know what I mean? I think it's that's what I was saying earlier about like getting out of your own way. And if it, you're authentic and you're real, and you're doing it for the right reasons, you'll go through the ups and downs and the roller coaster of life as we all do. But you'll get somewhere close to where you're supposed to be. You know what I mean? Even if it's not exactly what you envisioned, if you're willing to compromise, and most often it's what, what is the, there's a quote by, uh, is it attributed to the Dalai Lama or Buddha? Um, st sometimes not getting what you want is a stroke of genius. And I th But if you still pursue it, you'll still get, like I said, towards somewhere that you yeah, where you're meant to be, you know, and I, I think you've seen every omen there perfectly. Um, so it's you've the, got the, the, so go on. The, the 15 grand I didn't make by washing my passport, I've actually had in artist grants since. Um, so I had a 10 grand arts council grant that I got whilst I was stuck in England because they increased the DYCP quota during uh, the lockdowns, and then 
um this 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 very unique japanese charity that someone suggested to me and i got that too so yeah that that, that 15 grand i was i was more upset about not being able to go back to the rainforest honestly mm. was that, that that was what i was grieving was the rainforest not the money um but the money was a big hit like i was like fuck i could have made i could have paid off my over budget in like a few weeks and now it's going to take months like that's the difference between the the portsmouth shitty council job and mm. the canadian most expensive resort in North America with a huge tip tech job. Very, very big difference. Uh, in six months saving, you're talking like three grand versus 15, I think. Um, mm. But yeah, and then I've I've met my soulmate, who's my DJ. We're going on tour in Japan. Such none of this would have been happening if I was in Canada. And fuck being in Canada during 2001 and two. It was yeah. one of the most fascist, fascist countries I've seen. So exactly yeah. so not getting what you want is sometimes a stroke of luck a stroke of genius yeah you know 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah that's awesome um i'm looking to come to and obviously so i wanted to i'm trying to there's an order i am trying to go through in my brain here uh you're yeah, obviously yeah. You, you go in sort of at the end of the month but beforehand you've got quite a big uh name guest coming to a gig in the northeast you want to tell us about yeah that? yeah so lavender fields is this really unique um a Californian reggae musician and she is kind of like the yin to my yan in many ways we're both working in these sort of new unique styles of reggae here and there doing our own thing um I'm doing it with the deep masculine blah, blah, and bravado and chop the fucking heads off the bank of cunts man um and she's doing it in the very very love positivity new 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 age sort of styles um and she's coming over to England, so she's, she's luckily just in time to come to the tour launch which is at little buildings on the 20th of no, September. We actually leave Newcastle on the 21st and we fly on the 22nd. So I'm only going to, unfortunately, I'm going to have like 12 hours of Lavender Fields after knowing her um, for about 10 years through the internet or so. Um, so that, that is a bit of a shame, but it's, I'll take it over nothing. And it's great that she can come all the way up to Newcastle to, to play at this gig. Yeah. Um, tickets are online on the Little Buildings website. They're eight, 10, or 15 pounds. I've put the 15 pound option for any spenny, spenny guys out there or gals because the tour itself has already gone like maybe two grand over budget and I've been at university. So it's a bit of a sting. I've, I've just got enough money to cover it and I do have a plan for afterwards. Um, but uh, equally it's slim pickings right now, trying to get all this, trying to ride this wave that's been given to me. Um, I've, I, I've been given a, a five grand grant, but um, that falls short of everything I need to be doing out there. Even it's crazy how much expensive it is. Japanese economy is kind of God in Japan and I've given it 20 grand. So maybe I'll be blessed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in, yeah, entirely. entirely. I, mean, I think as you've, you spoke again, that if your heart's in the right place, you will end up in the right place. And I think that it's, you recognised, obviously now in retrospect, and you probably did in some way as well when you washed your passport, that hey, I'm just going <laughs> in a different direction. But as long as you're going in some direction, then you are, you're revolving and growing as a person. I think that's the ultimate measure of achievement. And I think there is this thing that, the cliche thing we all say of like, well, you're making your inner child proud, but I can literally in this conversation with you see that you are manifesting oh, a mature version of your inner child. You didn't lose it. You've managed to, in the face of the world and everything that it tries to throw at you, lean into it harder and harder. And that is something that I'm really hoping that people who've, who've, who've just uh, consumed this podcast really get the grip on because it's, Thanks so much, but no, it's just really it's interesting. It's interesting you picked up on that because that is a huge part of me. And one of the you know I, um, one of the nicest little quote things I've seen for a long time was like, "Yeah, live a life that makes you a child and your um, deathbed self happy and stuff." And I, I, I really, I really think that's. I never thought that's what I was doing until I saw that quote, and I was like, "That is exactly what I'm doing. It's really good." And uh, honestly, as well, like my actual, like not my inner child, my actual child is um, damaged in many ways, uh, like childhood trauma and that. And it's like. Um, and I've I've seen uh, people I've seen in my life I've seen that go two ways it could end up in like mass productivity or mass destruction it's like it's like that uh, god of destruction god of creation thing and I think trauma can lead you to become either of those and um, I'm very grateful that what my parents people around me the music and culture and films and stuff and books I've read over the years have led me to the the, the creation side of things because uh, I know I know people that have unfortunately tra traumatized in similar or different ways and have ended up on the other side of the coin and it's really it's really sad to watch yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And just anybody that wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, as we spoke of before, at any point you can change. Redemption is capable for all. You know, I mean, 100%. you are in it. You can be anything, yeah. Yeah. So 
Never get lost. You can dwell in it, folks. I'll give you 24 hours. You can have your day. Hmm. But the next day when you wake up, it's a new day, people. It's... Well, years, bro. Some people can, I mean, some people could spend 20, 30 years being a bit of a waste man. And they do just, they just switch on and go to AA or something and everything switches around. Like, I've I've seen that happen too. But I've also seen people take take their trauma and their inability to find themselves to the deathbed too. And that's that's really sad as well. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's, that's what we're, we're, we're here to, to, like we're saying, we're talking about solutions a lot. And we're here to try and lead, lead the way and be be the change ourselves and that. And, you, you know, you can't change anyone else. You can, I've had definitely had a savior complex over the years and been a bit close to these people. But I'm saying that their, their trauma has led to these destructive tendencies that are creative ones. And for some reason, I've like latched onto them trying to trying to change them and save them and make them better. But then I've realized that it's impossible unless they do it themselves. And all that energy can be put into myself, isn't it? Mm-hmm. There's a there's a quote that what does it say? Be somebody that would make your inner child uh, the child not be the person that you needed as a child. And mm. I think that is how we act. I'm very much the same. And I had a similar revelation a few years ago of that the best thing I can do is be one of the people that inspired me to change my life. Nobody came and pulled me out of the gutter. People around me inspired me. And the further I traveled and the more I became who I am, the more people around me inspired me and the more I became who I am. And it's that cycle. You know what I mean? It's the diet. Are you going to pass that, you gonna pass that button or what? Maybe maybe yeah. that's the problem is they like, like some of these that, that that was probably where the savior complex came from right because you know some of these people I'm talking about the more destructive side of things it feels like they haven't been past that baton and I guess that's what I was trying to do yeah. was just to be like give them support and like like let's just take one like very damaged person off the top of my head without naming names um, homeless uh, needed somewhere to stay so yeah he stayed at my house got him a suit but literally bought him a suit and shoes and sent, sent him helped him get some interviews helped like help, helped him with a cv etc et you know all that support stuff and all, all this time he was like siphoning off my coin collection like i had every single pound 50 pence 10 fight you know i had every all of them like all of them from like the 90s to, to 2020 i just i just collected working in places that had tills slowly collecting them and he was siphoning them all off for ketamine so Hundreds of pounds face value and probably in, in 50, 60 years, thousand, tens of thousands of pounds like market value. Um, and whilst I was supporting him, his 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 dark side, his self-destructiveness led into sight like to be stealing from me. <laughs> it was just so that, that was me trying to pass the baton and be like, look, here's the positivity. Here's what you can. But it, it didn't bring positivity to his life. It just it, it just enabled his, his leeching and, and his destructiveness. So it's hard because I want to pass that baton. So you got to. I've got to find a way to that you to, to say these 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 inspiring people that try and pass this baton on. But it's it's. I don't think it is in in that uh, in personal relationships with damaged people. Uh, yeah. As much as, I've, as much as I've as much as I've tried. No, I think we, yeah, each can do a little here and there. But I think exactly that that you you are now, and I don't know how long ago you, this anecdote is placed, but you are now in the person that you present in in this conversation to me someone that is aware of that mechanism and is doing it through your art form. Like I said, that it's, mm. I, I look, laugh that's, that's the other day, it, yeah. like yeah, I re-listened to, um, oh, why can't I think of it? I've only got Meteor in my head. What the hell's the first link, the first Linkin Park album, second, first Linkin Park album called, um, I don't know. Sorry. I did listen to it. Uh, hy- hybrid theory. Hybrid yeah, theory. Yeah, yeah. I re-listened to that in full the other day. And I was just like thrown back to this emotive, chaotic state of the songs were just like they, they made me feel these emotions i had decades ago <laughs> like and but in this body that's lived in the decades since and there was this real mashup of nostalgia and pride that came from it of that i've grown because of that music, that that really it helped me at the times. So it was you know you are you sure why you listen to sad music or angry music? It'll just make you angry or sad. And it's like we know that those art forms spoke to the the experience of the artist, and they they put it out there in the hopes that it resonates with others. And it's that resonance that inspires them and knocks them out of that frequency. And you can't do that in front of them. You can't make the horse drink the water. You can make sure there's water. You can even put a sign up, but the horses can't fucking read. So the best thing we can do is, is make water. In this case, that's art. You know what I mean? It's everybody is 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 so thirsty right now to quench their thirst on something meaningful that they'll pay a thousand dollars to see Oasis and then they'll still walk out with their parched going, I'm not I need culture. I need I need I need art. I need some something, you know. How do I show these people my music? I don't know. I wish <laughs> I fucking knew. Rhetorical joke, mate. Obviously, coming on podcast around, I really appreciate the platform, but it's it has been I know there's people out there. And it's really, it's really hard to reach them, but um, I just keep going. And, and you know, if, if I do reach them, they'll be treated with the fact there's already 15 albums out. 
<laughs> exactly. That's the thing you put in in the quality of the work, and it's sure it's uh, a discography that describes your evolution. Do you know what I mean? And that, it? Yeah, it, yeah. So it, if it, anyone does, if anyone does latch onto, like, you know, Deanna, I mean, I really don't like them, and they're, they're, they're people, but just as an example, um, when Ninja blew up with the Anthurd for putting on his whole like gangster bravado and that, um, it led me to going back into his back catalogue. He'd been a rapper for like 11, 12 years before the Anthurd blew up. And uh, my favorite stuff was this really, really old, obscure stuff by him. So yeah, maybe. Yeah. But like I said, I think I think I'm inverse. Like I think I've been getting better and better. Where I think he got worse and worse. And I think that it can happen either way for people. Um, yeah, I think it's it's what what you you chase it. If it's the art form, I think over time it depends whether you're satiated by it or you're left uh, hungering for more. Like, but if you think, oh, I've made all of this stuff, and you, rather than being like, oh, I made all this stuff, you're like, yeah, I've made all of this, but why am I not successful yet? I think your your perception shit, and then over time, it, you, the it can change the emotional like drawer of the music, and because you know you can hear like somebody that really gives a shit when somebody's really fucking singing something or playing something as an instrument, you can feel passion. You don't need to know drums to see like Joey Jordanson, rest in peace, like smashing out for fucking Slipknot. You know what I mean? Like you you can have this appreciation. So I think the the best thing you do is, is to continue on on the craft and it's not necessarily about the numbers i mean my numbers for this podcast are quite minimal yeah i've had some globally renowned fucking people on this platform and hopefully fingers crossed we'll have some more and i i think like you said eventually the billionaire problem will be solved and thus that will then solve the censorship problem the restriction problem and all of this other stuff that is there once people get a taste for real they don't want that plastic mass manufactured shit anymore they'll go out of their way to find a way to, to feel that thing. You know what I mean? And I think we're just, we're in that ebb and flow where the mainstream is in the commercial side of things is at its absolute fucking peak. And we're just going to have to rebel again and start with grassroots venues, with free parties, with small events, with, do you know what I mean? And it's, it then builds back up. Then the capitalist machine captures it again. Then it, and it just goes in these cycles. And I think we're just approaching the end of a cycle. So it is that duplicitous thing in our brains of, well, how the fuck do we get out to the people versus, well, when we do, we've got all this. Do you know yeah, what I mean? But if you, if you, you're, you're really right. And if you want to see, if you want to see any physical evidence um, that we are definitely approaching a cycle, you just need to look at the, uh, the, the like financial bubbles. So you've got the, like the, the dot com bubble, then you've got the housing bubble, and now you've got what's called like the everything bubble. And uh, the everything bubble is like 10, 15 times the height of the housing bubble. And, uh, and it's, it's, it can't really happen again. So when this bubble pops, which is imminent, um, it will be the end of an era. And I just wonder what's going to come next. Will it be will it be full 100% digital control grid and ID? Um, or will it be back to like grassroots and community and stuff? Um, and it, it can, we can come out the, the, the other end either way. Uh, don't really know exactly when or how it's going to happen, but the best we can do is just be ready and and, and uh, remember like all the stuff we've been talking about, it? like community and that. And, 100%. Um, yeah. And just one, one, one backtrack to another point you made is um, learning to measure success in different ways. You know, we've been we've been trained to we've been trained to measure ourselves, our personalities, and our achievements and our successes in a very capitalist uh, lens. But the cap capitalism is completely abusive, and it's like almost an abusive. It's almost self abuse, um, self harm to measure yourself through that lens because it's an yeah. abusive system. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm thousands and thousands of pounds in debt to music, where people would say, "Oh, you're not successful in music until you're thousands of pounds up." But I actually consider that debt a success because it's a success of dedication and passion, et cetera, like the other things we've been talking about in it. It's all part of an ecosystem as well. The money that you've paid in has come out of the other end at somebody else that has found larger successes at words. You know, I mean it's all the it's a big pot. So anytime somebody yeah. buys from it in so it's support. If you care about the thing, you don't oh, I'm not number one, so I'm not gonna participate. No, your participation means they can be a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. And if they all participate, it's yeah, like you said, it's just being part of the thing. Recognize and be humble for where you are in the world. If you're doing something, be grateful for where you are because I guarantee you two years ago you would have fucking jumped over your grand to get there. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're if you on that trajectory, you're on that trajectory. So just respect it. Keep putting the work in. And yeah, connect with the it's other. It's 12 years since I first wrote a, a, a digital reggae rap song sitting in a one-bedroom apartment in Japan and we're about to tour it. Like, that's... That's how long it takes people. Like, yeah, trust, yeah, like, especially if what you're doing is, is a little bit left field. Like it can take 12, 20, and it can happen after your lifetimes. Some of history's best artists, etc. The uh, Katsushika Hokusai, the Japanese woodblock printer that everyone knows, the, the great wave of Kanagawa woodblock print. 
mm-hmm. um, which is a collection of like 30, 30 portraits of Mount Fuji or something. Like when they came out, and people were like, "What's this? This isn't woodblock. This is weird. This isn't how we do it. This is this is this is against tradition. You're a fucking weirdo, Katsushika Hokusai. Sit down." <laughs> like, mm-hmm. But you know, he's the most famous Japanese woodblock printer ever now, and he, yeah. that happened after he died. Exactly. That's exactly the fucking thing, man. It's the bigger the thing you do, the more likely it is that you won't see the reward. It's that proverb of plant date trees. You know what I mean? It's you do you if you really care for this thing, you only get to carry the light for a small time. So make sure you fuel it well and you pass it on before you extinguish it. Yeah. That's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do, man. And I think you're doing it to great success, brother. Honestly, I'm gonna try and make Thank it to, you so the, much, sir. to the gig uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, I definitely want to get you back on when you're settled in to Japan and talk all well, about Japan, it. Well, Japan, so, so yeah, we can do that. But Japan's Japan's uh, it's like three weeks with a JR Rail Pass, um, with with like ten days in Osaka either side, and then it's uh, six weeks of volunteering. And then we're going to Vietnam to where it's cheap as chips and there isn't the cost of living crisis to edit all the videos. And uh, I'm gonna try and set up like remote work and that, so I don't have to get shafted by the cost of living over here um and i've got more time for art hopefully in southeast asia so um there's definitely we will we will never be settled in japan like i said the 10 days in osaka mm. they're like the most they're the most settled will be so happy to talk to you then at any time um but yeah most settled will be vietnam which is 17th of december i think yeah um but yeah man we, we can do it we can do a live one if i get if i get a sim card with um internet and that we could we could probably do one like where I'm walking around, it could be really interesting. I can like maybe like show you around like this, the, what's what's called the ghetto of Nishinari. It's so cute. Oh, this gets called the ghetto. It's actually the nicest <laughs> suburb in the entirety of Japan. Some of the most friendly people ever. Um, so yeah, but it's a really cool little place. Um, yeah, man, just hit us up. We we could do yeah. anything again. Yeah, yeah. No, awesome. Yeah, I've just really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think obviously with the it's it's, it's so unique and different to what it is that a lot of my audience will. Um, We'll, we'll get to experience myself included like i have a, a great affinity for and fascination of, of japanese culture and of like uh the the way of the samurai the history and the heritage and mm. just their their approach to it seems very neurodivergent in a way the order is that they figured out the chaos of things and just here's the structure of the stuff and it's just oh you just do it do you know what i mean where it's not all the unwritten rules and the etiquette is very formalized and known and you know like i said it's it's not authoritarian in its rule like in the structure of the culture but the culture the culture naturally fluctuates and is a, an organic expression of it and it's just so, so different to to anything i've experienced anywhere else yeah and on the surface on the surface because you know it's, it is quite an obedient bushido kind of based country and it can sometimes be it, you can sometimes stereotype japan and japanese people a bit and forget that like every everyone's still a very very unique person for the character and that and there's a really good uh youtube series called konbini confessions so convenience store in japan japanese is konbini k-o-n-b-i-n-e-i so just check out konbini confessions it's like it's really cool little uh it's, it's mostly into drinking culture so he's, he's, he's walking around interviewing like people that are pissed but <laughs> it's really really funny little window into like the the slightly less stereotypical side of japan mm-hmm. and stuff and people's real raw personalities yes which is which the country's full of just like any other country but yeah that that, that the, the the bushido roots and um the economy being god can sometimes lead to a stereotype that it's just this very like suit based salary salary man culture which a lot of the country is um but obviously there's there's so many more layers to it than that like there is anywhere and uh like i was saying with myself you were talking about what is a geordie at the start stereotypical geordies and you're not no one's going to think of me in any any realm of stereotypical geordiness really um mm. but i'm a geordie through and through in it just there's different types well that's it you're breaking stereotypes i think we 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 all can with this yeah, certain aspects of stereotypes that I guess at some point were birthed of something, maybe a, a grain of truth, as it were. Um, but I think it's often just it's that oversimplification that leads to kind of eventually bigotry, if, if not addressed. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, yeah, I think it's just why I, I like this podcast is it's just unique stories, unique people doing unique things um, of just of great interest to me personally. And luckily, this fine audience gets to enjoy it for a couple of hours. Um, all right, sweet. Um Let's wrap up here, then I'll uh, let you get off. I'll do some housekeeping. Uh, this will be going live this week, so you'll be getting tagged in a load of stuff across social shortly. Um, but, yeah, thank you for taking Sick. the time, time, brother. Really appreciate it. No, bless you, mate. Thanks for having us. It's been great. Really nice. Cheers. Anytime, anytime, man. Like I say, hopefully catch you in the tune in a couple of weeks. Uh, I've been out for, for quite a while, so this could be quite quite interesting. I look forward to it. Sick, sick. All right. Peace and love, brother. I'll catch you in a bit. You too. All right. Bye.
Well, there you go, folks. That was Jody Bigfoot. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, something a bit different from the usual uh, that we kind of have been doing here at The Simple Life. You know me. I do like to have unique conversations with unique people. We've kind of fallen into a pattern of a lot of cannabis and drug content. Obviously, they are big uh, aspects and parts to this podcast but I also want to just have raw and authentic conversations with with interesting people that I have either known know or can connect to through my uh, wide and diverse network um, so yeah I think today showcased uh, that quite well uh, local artist to me um, so anybody local that is in the northeast uh, we'll be sharing uh, links uh, below for tickets and whatnot do check out the event I think it will be the my first night out in I want to say like eight years, maybe more. I don't know. God, am I getting that old? Man, this time passes so goddamn quick. Um, yeah, hope you found something of, of interest uh, in that. We covered some great subjects, I, I thought. Uh, some quite inspirational stuff as well about, you know, um, coming to self-awareness and consciousness and to take responsibility for, for oneself and to, you know, self-motivate, to self-regulate, to find discipline in your own life as a means to finding what it is you have to give the world i think that's as we said a very important thing is that you have something that nobody else does i can't tell you what it is you have to find that and in finding that you will give something of value and a meaning and frankly a gift to the world because if you are doing what you're truly passionate and caring for i'd like to think that you wouldn't be doing anything of detriment to to the, the world society or others you know what i mean um yeah, I'm not going to waffle on too long. Uh, that was a really good recording. I've yeah, I've enjoyed that. I'm glad that was the first recording back in the hot seat. Uh, as you guys may have noticed, Jody wasn't Mendo Dope. Um, had a bit of an issue time zones uh, with the guys. Uh, we're trying to rearrange a date at the minute, but they're quite busy with uh, festival season and going into Croptober in the States. But we will be rearranging uh, with Bleezy and Old E. So yeah, check out that. I think next week we'll be looking at mike barnes i think is next in the seat or there's maybe somebody else don't have my notes available um but yeah i'm trying to get a load bulk recorded at the minute obviously i'm busy with other projects but i do want to try and get back to regular weekly episodes um i should be getting back to doing clips and shorts as well into next month once the physical events that i'm involved in over the coming weeks are done so do check them out give them likes shares everything else do appreciate that it helps the channel immensely um yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm done. Um, appreciate you as always, folks. If you want to give us a like, a share, a thumbs up, uh, a rating, a heart, whatever it is that you do on your platform, show appreciation. I appreciate it and you. Uh, check out simplelife.com uh, for all backdated sort of articles. Uh, check out the legacyculture.co.uk for new material that myself and Tyler Green have been working on. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep your eyes open for the product earth write up that will be coming imminently. Um, yeah, if you really enjoyed this, check us out on patreon.com forward slash The Simple Life, where for less than a cup of coffee, you can help me keep the lights on on this little project of mine. All right, you've been beautiful. I'm going to go enjoy what actually looks like a, a marginal amount of sunshine outside and get some vitamin D. All right, peace and love, folks. I'll see you next week with, I don't know, somebody. He'll be awesome. You'll love it. I'll love it.